I figured I'd end the 2019 series of Let's Talk About with a story that is by far one of my favorites. I know I'm entering into uncharted territory for the channel, seeing as this is the first visual novel I'll be covering for LTA, but since some VNs have gameplay mechanics, they can albeit on a bit of a technicality, be considered games. Granted, this wasn't the reason I chose to cover this VN as the actuality is this is my favorite one, well, I want to showcase it for others. It just so happens that if I do decide to cover other VNs, it won't be as awkward due to me already having a video on one. Before I get on with the video proper, I will talk about the disclaimer card you just saw. YouTube's method of dealing with what is considered adult content is inadequate to say the least. You either don't list the video as adult only and run the risk of both video and channel being taken down because YouTube prefers to side with people who abuse their flagging system, or you do list it as adult only and watch your video get no traction at all as it won't pop up in searches. YouTube itself is an adult platform much akin to other social sites like Twitter, yet just like the hell site, it doesn't treat it as such and content creators like Hart Weigen, there goes the illusion that this script wasn't rewritten post-2019, who operate fully under YouTube's guideline and do nothing wrong, get punished. My disclaimer cards are an attempt of a third choice. While I will say here that all my videos are intended for people that are 18 and older, as I personally find it weird when a YouTuber's community is made up of mostly kids, and kids should be supervised when on the internet, I never had to express that because the only really questionable content my other videos was violence. For Saya no Uda and other media properties that have subject matter that isn't for everyone, however, I don't want people to bumble into something that they might not want to or shouldn't see. <laughs> I think the first thing that I should bring up is this man. For those who aren't in the know, this is Gen Urobuchi, brainchild of Saya no Uda, some of the early Nitro Plus VNs like Phantom of Inferno and Kikakugai the Cyber Slayer, and the lead writer of Fate Zero, as both Gen and Nasu are friends. Don't let his unassuming appearance fool you, as while this might be one of the few photos where Gen isn't wearing his trademark sunglasses, this man is known in fan circles as Urobuchi, a reference to the fates of the characters in his stories. To say that Urobuchi struggled with cynicism and nihilism for a part of his career would be an understatement. As the man explains in the postface of the first volume of Fate Zero, I am full of hatred towards men's so-called happiness and had to push the characters I poured my heart out to create into the abyss of tragedy. While I will return back to this postface, as that sentence is only one part of the human being called Gen Urobuchi, there is an explanation for as to why Gen himself believed he was infected with what he called the tragedy syndrome. In an interview with Shinji Die No Mixture magazine Black Past, Gen explains that when he was 24, he contracted a disease from an ongoing epidemic at the time. The severity of the disease was great, as it could have killed Gen if he didn't receive treatment. That's not what stuck with Urobuchi, however. Instead, it was the recovery period. In his own words, Urobuchi describes himself as being erased from society. Though he didn't have any lasting scars, he felt like he was a corpse, and that by spending several months living like a dead man, he felt that he had tamed something like the eyesight of the dead. That's why Gin has no hesitation when it comes to killing characters or writing tragedies. Side note, I will post the Black Past interview in the description as while the main focus of it is Madoka Magica, Gin does elaborate on some of his past works as well as himself and his views. Also, don't take this as me railing against stories that are dark in tone. People can write any kind of story that they want. I'll acknowledge that dark stories aren't for everyone, particularly because they delve into taboo subject matter and not everyone can handle that. However, that doesn't mean writers should be disallowed from writing about subject matter that is controversial just because a few people don't like it. One of the most powerful aspects of fiction is that it's able to tackle tough subject matter and handle it in a way that is both creative as well as informative, all the while letting people be in their comfort zone, as fiction is fiction, it isn't real. The key detail I wanted to bring up is that Gin did feel like he was being beaten down by his own work and had a bit of an unhealthy relationship with his own style of writing. I don't have to tell you that the Fate Zero quote I started with isn't something a person with a healthy mindset says. Back to the postface and the part that brings everything around, when Urobuchi became so frustrated to the point that he never wanted to write another script ever again, the writer sought out to speak with close friend Nasu about his blight. Visiting Nasu's house, Gin didn't get to speak to him as instead Fate illustrator Takeshi Takuchi proposed what was going to happen during Fate Zero to both Nasu and Gin. The thing is, Nasu had the same idea, make the story of Fate Zero a tragedy. Any residual dismay had been alleviated and as Gin says in the postface, I found myself once again immersed in the joy of weaving together a story. It can be said that the launch of Fate Zero saved my writing career. Fate's ending was all 
already set in stone as Shiro Emiya would still overcome the trials of the Fifth Holy Grail War, thus leading to a happy ending, allowing Gen to write the tragedy he had envisioned in his heart. Per his own words, no matter how I display the darkness inside my heart, from an overall look I am nevertheless a partner of the warrior of love, Nasu Kanoko. Though he still deals with his lingering ghosts, many of his newer works are notably less cynical as he has once again found the part of himself that knows the joy of creation. I wanted to go on this dive into Gen Urobuchi as while Saya no Uda was written during what I will call the height of Urobuchi's state of cynicism. Like the man himself, the story has a tinge of hope that I will no doubt cover in the story tab. As mentioned earlier, Gin joined Nitro Plus as one of the founding writers during the company's inception circa 2000. Saya was released as the sixth visual novel for the company, being slotted in between Zanma Taisei, Demon Bane, and Phantom Integration. Though the original release of Saya was December 26, 2003, it was not translated until 2009 with the original fan translation. Despite Saya not having much of a presence over here in America, IDW somehow got the rights and produced a three-part comic series dubbed Song of Saya, what Saya no Uda translates to in English, which ran between February and April of 2010. This will be the only time I mention this run as not only does it take many liberties with the original story, it's a bit shit, like with any American adaptation. An improved fan translation for the VN would then come out in 2013. It would take until August 13th, 2019 for Saya to see an American release via the Steam storefront in Jast USA. Something to bring up is that the Steam version of Saya is censored and that there is a patch from Jast USA that costs around $4 that reinstates all of the censored scenes. The uncensored version is also sold on Jast USA. I'm mentioning this because the version I used was the improved fan translated version as by the time I was finished recording and writing the ill-fated original version of the script, the Steam and Jast version came out. I do have footage of the Steam version to showcase the difference between the two, but just keep in mind that most of the footage is using the 2013 version. <laughs> To begin, this section will start off with two prefaces. One, the story of Sai is told in different perspectives that range from characters within the story to an unnamed third person who's kinda like the narrator of this story. I'll do my best to say which perspective a section is in, but the perspective does switch often, so if I don't, use context clues to figure out. Second, and most importantly, the story starts off with a warning, and while I've already given one in the form of the disclaimer at the start of the video, I'm going to give another one. Saya no Uda is not for everyone, as it has instances of murder, cannibalism, and rape. I'm not forcing you to watch this, and if you want to recommendation of something to watch that isn't that heavy, go watch my Team NT 2003 or Pokemon Snap videos. With that out of the way, our story opens up with a horrendous sight, a fetid mass of fat burbling a language untouched by human lips. If one listens closely, it sounds like the mound is attempting to speak in Japanese, though it's as if the monster's voice is being filtered by a radio that was submerged in some forgotten swamp and left to decay. Making matters worse is that there isn't just one horrid abomination, as the character we are in the perspective in notes that there are two others sitting next to him and all three creatures are sharing a conversation amongst themselves while they consume a foul liquid. Apparently these creatures are friends of the person, a man, though he does go on to say that he has to carefully listen to what the blobs are saying so he can avoid arousing the suspicion of his friends. He has been doing this for three months. Surrounding the man is Koji, the beast with the slightly deeper inflection in its voice, Omi, the one who squeals with a high pitch, and Yo, the mask sitting next to our man and is gagging him with its revolting stench. Reflecting more on his relationship with the three, the man points out that it's as if his life is rebuilt using gore as the construction material, but only the sights and smells have changed. The city he lives in and the friends he knows still exist, albeit as twisted versions of themselves, leaving the man isolated and alone. Wanting to just quietly resign himself and listen to the gargled conversation, the monster known as Koji asks the man, Fuminori, about his thoughts regarding the group's ski trip. <laughs> Not wanting to look at the disgusting... face? 
I don't know, man. It's like trying to make sense of a Jackson Pollock painting. Fuminori delivers a neutral answer while essentially cowering from the beast. Koji asks another question, this time regarding Fuminori's supposed injuries that we will learn about later, prompting Fuminori to bring up his doctor's appointment and use it as an out so he doesn't have to continue being next to his friend's disgusting forms. It's better than Fuminori walloping Koji with a chair, a thought that Fuminori has while going to leave the cafeteria that he and the others are in, as not only would that break the illusion that Fuminori is okay, in his own words, he'd be sent back to the hospital and be locked away forever. As if trying to assure himself, Fuminori mentally tells himself that he isn't crazy as he heads to his appointment. The same cafeteria scene then plays, this time in the perspective of our unnamed third-person view, allowing us to see that whatever Fuminori is suffering from, it affects his core senses as Koji, Omi, and Yo, plus the cafeteria, all look normal. Just like before, the three friends are talking about their skiing trip, though as it turns out, Omi actually wants to go skating. Koji backs up Omi's idea as he is her boyfriend, causing Yo a bit of jealousy as the man she has eyes for only sees her as a slimy lump with his. The conversation then reaches the same point where Koji asks his question, though he did so out of consideration for Yo, seeing as Fuminori and her are in some sort of relationship than just being friends. Don't. Like before, Fuminori rushes out of the cafeteria, but the narrator does point out how slightly distressed Koji is with how Fuminori is acting now, as well as alluding to what happened three months ago. Looking at the yen bill and Fuminori's untouched coffee, Omi is the first to speak out of the remaining three, voicing her annoyance over the new Fuminori. Koji tries to defend his best friend, but Omi won't have it as she feels like she's going crazy around Fuminori and his behavior. <laughs> What happened three months ago is then revealed. A tractor trailer flipped over onto the Sakisaka family car, killing Fuminori's parents and leaving the man in critical condition. Though, as if it was a cruel twist of fate, Fuminori survived but was changed as when his friends visited him at the hospital, he freaked out like he didn't recognize them. Omi, once again speaking her mind, mentions that Fuminori looks at the group like they were beasts, an observation that is on point, but before Omi can continue her tirade, Koji tells her to knock it off as all this talk about Fuminori is affecting the the narrator points out that Yo is thankful for Koji's thoughtfulness, but her relationship with Fuminori is her problem and one that she needs to solve by herself. She has asked Fuminori about taking their relationship to the next step, and while he hasn't rejected her, she asked that question before the accident, thus leaving her no answer. As Yo continues to stew of her unrequited feelings in the cold winter air, we jump from the cafeteria to Dr. Ryoko Tombo's office. Unlike Fuminori's friends, Tombo knows something is up as she can tell her patient has closed himself off from the world, but Fuminori blatantly lies to Tombo while not directly looking at her. Yeah, not anymore. Putting aside his charts as Fuminori is being difficult, Tombo explains that the treatment he received that saved him was experimental and many others who have had it now suffer from various serious neurological issues. The reason for the checkups is to make sure Fuminori isn't suffering from one, but as the man himself fears what might happen if Tombo finds out, his lips are sealed on the matter. Displaying his knowledge of medical practice and wanting to solidify that nothing is wrong with him, Fuminori asks about his MRI scan, to which Tombo says nothing abnormal showed up on it. However, the narrator does specifically say that if the problem was inorganic, there's nothing Tombo can do unless Fuminori opens up. Tombo asks Fuminori to trust her as she is there to help him, to which Fuminori says that he does. He then asks his own question if that he can come to her for anything, to which she says he can, though this only annoys Tombo as Fuminori has already asked this question last week. Continuing from last week, Fuminori asks about a man called Dr. Ogai, causing Tombo to freeze up. She believes that Fuminori shouldn't be in the know about him and tries to brush her patient aside, but Fuminori uses the two's mutual trust as leverage to get an answer. Not above line, Tombo tells Fuminori that she didn't have any contact with Ogai and that he left the hospital for personal reasons. <laughs> おそらく個人的な事情でしょうね。
Going ahead with her own question, Tombo asks why Fuminori needs to know about Ogai, to which he explains that Ogai has gone missing and that a close relative of his is looking for the doctor. Falling into a weaved spider's web, Tombo blurts out that Ogai didn't have any relatives, causing Fuminori to verbally pounce on her before easing off to beg Tombo for help. She tells him to ring up the police, though in saying this, the narrator reveals how dangerous that is for the hospital slash university. Everyone involved with the Ogai incident, Tombo included, would be investigated and whatever the hospital wants to keep hidden would be shown to the world. Luckily, Tombo knows that Fuminori wouldn't go to the police as the reason why the Ogai incident was buried was because the doctor had no relatives. This poses another question, however. How does Fuminori know about the missing doctor? All Tombo can offer is conjecture about the doctor's whereabouts, causing Fuminori to end his line of questioning. Writing his progress down as good in the charts, Tombo tries to schedule another appointment, but before she can ask what time would be best, Fuminori has already left. Back in the eyes of the madman, Fuminori muses over the idea that because he has accepted his new surroundings as the norm, he can live a somewhat normal life. I mean, normal if you're Isaac Clarke, that is. He knows he has a form of agnosia, a real-life disorder, wherein a person loses the ability to identify the things around them, and in the case of this story has been extremely exaggerated, and that his chances for survival were slim, so he can't really blame the doctors that saved him. All he can do, at least in his head, is laugh at Tombo and those at the hospital for their failure and call himself unlucky. Despite surrendering himself to the fate that he was given, as again, we don't know if there actually is a cure for Fuminori's condition, and it's not like he wants to risk anything to find out if Tombo can help him, Fuminori isn't completely alone in the world, as he has a silver lining amidst the decay. Rushing back to his house, Fuminori comments that while his parents being dead does make him sad, he believes he has suffered more than they have. The phrase, fate worse than death, comes to mind, but because his parents are no longer in the picture, Fuminori doesn't have to worry about them getting uppity at him for living with what he calls a strange girl. Entering his abode, a perfectly human voice rings out, welcoming Fuminori home. Okay. Any dread that Fuminori had while outside of his house becomes washed away at the sound of the voice and he answers back to it, calling out to Saya that he is home. Walking to the house's entrance, Saya, who looks identical to a regular person outside of some observations from Fuminori that bring up how pale her skin is and how odd her hair and eye color are, and Fuminori share some talk about the day's proceedings. It's made obvious that Saya cares immensely for Fuminori as she pulls him into a hug, with even Fuminori's thoughts pointing out that if Saya didn't exist, he would have succumbed to insanity earlier. While Fuminori was dealing with the horrors of the outside world, Saya was painting the house's living room and making dinner for the two. She hasn't finished preparing the food yet, giving Fuminori some time to work on painting the living room. Good to know that a man who can't recognize the world properly is a better painter than I am. The painting of the Sakisaka house originally started in the bedroom, as Fuminori couldn't get a wink of sleep and has gradually moved to the rest of the house. Not only does the paint help put Fuminori at ease, it also blocks off onlookers from seeing inside the house, as Fuminori is painted over the windows. The only people who know about what is going on inside are the two who live within the house. Before Fuminori can get more of the living room covered in puke green, not my first choice as I would have gone with beige, the most interesting of colors, Saya yells out that soup's on. Bringing the food to him, Saya does express her concern about the smell of paint thinner contained in the living room, though Fuminori tells her that the smell of the outside world is much worse. His perception of reality is already whacked out, what's wrong with getting high on the side? Asking if she is bothered by the smell, Fuminori is told by Saya that as long as he is okay with it, she will be too. Fuminori then tries to enjoy dinner, but it's not like he can stomach any regular food, whether it was made by Saya or not. Saya does know about Fuminori's condition and does resolve to make something that he can eat tomorrow. She'll do this for as long as it takes her to find something that he can eat. Seeing as Saya hasn't touched any of the food she made, Fuminori asks if she's going to eat any of it. Saya replies that she has already eaten, with Fuminori's thoughts filling us in that Saya always eats away from Fuminori. For what reason is yet to be determined, however, Fuminori is not going to force Saya to eat with him. Moving away from dinner, Fuminori informs Saya that he asked about her father, Dr. Ogai, at the hospital today. Although Saya is the one who asked Fuminori to look for her father, it's obvious that she cares way more about Fuminori than her father at this point in time. So. Still, she thanks him for all he has done and he does the same. 
Finished with dinner, the two then take a bath and engage in their nightly ritual, though in the middle of their lovemaking, Fuminori has a bit of a break, questioning why Saya does what she does for him. It's because Fuminori was all alone, just like Saya. The next day at college and back in the narrator perspective, Yo is making today the day she confronts Fuminori about their relationship status. As she is sitting in class waiting for the lecture to start, Yo starts scanning around the hall looking for Fuminori and spots him in a far corner of the room by himself. Usually he sits next to her, but that stopped happening after the accident. When class ends, he is the first to leave, though Yo manages to grab his attention before he can get too far away. Before Yo can ask if the two are a thing, she notices how gaunt and tense Fuminori is, wondering if the man is eating properly or is under a lot of stress. Saddened and hurt by how Fuminori looks, Yo doesn't let it get to her as she asks to speak with him. Moving to the courtyard on campus, Yo bears her heart to Fuminori, telling him that she feels like there's a large weight on his shoulders that's slowly killing him and that if he needs someone to open up to, he has Koji, Omi, and herself to talk to. ともだちってこんな時のためにいると思うんです。ご家族のことは本当に残念だったと思います。でも咲坂さんは一人ぼっちじゃありません。友君やおみちゃんやそれに私がいます。一人で背負い込んだりしなくても私たちでなんとかできることだってあると思うんですたとえ何もできないにしても話してさえくれればあなたが少しでも楽になるかもしれない私坂さんの力になりたいんです他のみんなも同じ気持ちだと Fed up and with a cold glare in his eyes, Fuminori tells Yo to shut up and that the two will never be a couple because he hates her. Adding more salt to the already rolling tears of Yo, Fuminori claims that Yo's feelings towards him aren't real and are only the product of Koji and Omi. Not wanting Fuminori to get the satisfaction of seeing her cry, Yo runs away from Fuminori, who has a cruel smile on his face as he watches Yo leave the courtyard. Waiting in the wings is Omi and Koji, who both see a teary-eyed Yo leave in a huff. Omi, not mincing words, calls Fuminori an asshole and tries very hard to not immediately go over to the man and kick his shit in. Koji, on the other hand, while unable to forgive how sadistic Fuminori's rejection of Yo was, is more perplexed than angry. By all accounts, Fuminori was never a cruel person before the incident, confirming to Koji that Fuminori has changed. Wanting some form of justice for Yo, Omi asks Koji if he's just going to let this event go unpunished, to which he says that he doesn't want to let it slide, but there isn't much the two can do as well. What was said to Yo has been said, and telling Fuminori off won't fix that. Still, Omi decides to give Fuminori a piece of her mind while telling Koji to take care of Yo, as his caring nature will be able to deal with Yo's broken heart. The couple then separates Koji to find Yo and Omi to the Sakisaka household. If only they knew the kind of domino effect they started from this action. Back to Fuminori, though he states that he feels miserable in the same line, he also says that he feels refreshed as he is one step away from being disconnected from his past life. A wave of mixed emotions wash over Fuminori since it's not like he wanted to hurt Yo, and he does display some form of remorse, recognizing that he probably should have ignored her. However, Fuminori fully believes that Yo is just playing to the tune of Koji, and Omi, completely disregarding Yo's actual feelings on the matter. Exhausted, both mentally and physically, by his encounter with Yo and the thought of having to ride the packed train back home, Fuminori rests on a coated bench to gather his strength back. A flashback in the perspective of Fuminori then happens, explaining to us his stay at the T University Hospital. When he first awoke from his coma, the world was pitch black and his senses were normal. It's when his sight returned did everything fall apart. One saving grace was that because Fuminori had been blind and awake for a period of time, he could come to terms with what happened to him and the surgery. As we will see later, being fully aware when put into the meat dimension is liable to snap anyone's mind in twain. Due to Fuminori's sight being twisted, his other senses fell as well. Deciding that dying would be a much better alternative than to live in a world of meat, Fuminori plotted his own suicide, though on one particularly restless night, a young girl who stood out against the gore visited his room, the girl of course being Saya. While being dumbstruck at the sight of her, Saya asked Fuminori an unusual question, aren't you afraid of 
of me. Ignoring the question, Fuminori asks Saya who she is and what she is doing. Realizing that Fuminori isn't scared of her, Saya goes to leave, but Fuminori pulls her right back in, asking the girl he just met if he can hold her hand. That's a power play if I've ever seen one, and it pays off for Fuminori. Whilst holding her hand, Fuminori tells Saya his predicament, causing her to take interest in the man and ask if she can visit again tomorrow night. <laughs> Over the rest of Fuminori's stay at the hospital, he and Saya share multiple conversations, with one of the bigger ones being about Saya's past. She originally lived with Ogai in the suburbs till he stopped returning home, forcing Saya to look for him in the hospital. Her stay has lasted around two months and has come up with Bubkiss. Noting the length of her stay, Fuminori asks Saya why she isn't in school, to which the girl says she doesn't need to be as Ogai taught her everything. Indeed, contrasting her youthful appearance, Saya has a wealth of knowledge that is quite unsettling. Not that Fuminori cares, mind you. What is something to mentally toil about is just how Saya avoids being caught, as before she met Fuminori, she did like to visit other patients in the psych ward and scare them. It's not like the nurses would believe the patients, and in fact, the local legend about the hospital is based on Saya. On Fuminori's final night at the hospital, he asked Saya to stay with him at his home if he could look for her father. While not giving an immediate answer besides telling Fuminori that he has to be discreet when searching for Ogai, Fuminori learns Saya's answer when she appears in his house. <laughs> Leaving the past and moving into the present, we return to Omi and our narrator outside of the Sakisaka home. While still slightly tilted over what happened at the courtyard, Omi has calmed down just a bit to the point that she can acknowledge how off the house's front yard is. Not only is it unkempt, a strange smell, one of rotten meat, is permeating around the house. The shutters have also been closed, probably since the day's morning, Omi guesses. Her anger flares back up again when she doesn't get a response from the intercom, and when Omi undoes the front paneling of it, she sees that it has been disconnected. Enraged by Fuminori's disgusting, despicable, lack of respect that he has for his friends, Omi barges through the household's front gate and door, though she immediately regrets this decision, as not only does the unbearable smell from before hit her much harder while standing in the house's entrance, an all too familiar, for us at least, cacophony of noise berates her ears. Having already made a poor life choice, Omi decides to follow it with another, calling out into the darkness of the house to get a response from the disembodied voice. Though it doesn't respond back to Omi's call, she does hear the sounds of something wet scuttling its way deeper into the unknown depths of the house. Any anger left within Omi has become extinguished with fear, as only Fuminori should be living inside, yet his shoes aren't in the foyer. Figuring, hey, I'm on a roll of making the absolute worst decisions in my life, Omi decides to venture into the tenebrae main hallway of the squalid abode. Inside, Omi chooses to be as quiet as a field mouse so as to not arouse whatever the semblance of a voice belongs to as she inspects the kitchen. Though the scene she finds seems superficially ordinary, the set dressing of the ominous stillness within the house and the setting sun dyeing everything in a nauseating shade of orange clues Omi in that something is exceptionally wrong. Yelling out again, Omi admonishes herself for her dangerously stupid behavior before feeling something cold seeping through her pantyhose. Clinging to both Omi's foot and the home's floor is a bizarre slime-like substance, which is the source of the nauseating odor percolating throughout the house and yard. 
Being nestled deep within the oppressive structure now, Omi's fight or flight instincts kick in, but because she has to turn her back towards the Stygian darkness seeping out from the living room to escape, and her own morbid fascination with what lurks within the deep blackness is driving her to probe the unknown contents of the den, she elects to explore the alien space. Feeling the side of the wall, Omi finds and flicks the light switch, revealing the mishmash of colors the room has been painted in. Falling to the ground in shock, Omi's attention is pulled away from the state of the den by a heap of tendrils wrapped around her body, one constricting her neck, poised to snap it in an instant. When she tries to fend off the tentacle on her neck, more shoot towards her body from the ceiling. Opting to look up, an action the narrator notes as the pinnacle of Omi's shoddy option selections, Omi absorbs the indescribable appearance of the horror hanging on the roof, splintering her mind. In seconds, even before she's able to scream, Omi is torn apart by the unknowable beast and it starts to feast on her remains. A little while after this, Fuminori, who we are in the perspective of, returns back to his abode and finds the front door wide open. Not only that, but he hears the sounds of smacking lips and smells a sweet fragrance that reminds him of Saya. Checking the living room, Fuminori finds a weird grass-like growth sprouting from the floor and Saya eating what he describes as fruit-slash-vegetable balls. Calling out to her, Fuminori notes that Saya seems to be embarrassed, almost like she was caught eating a person. The feeling of embarrassment is turned around on Fuminori, but instead of letting that get him down, Fuminori picks up one of the globs and eats it despite Saya trying to dissuade him from doing that. To her surprise, Fuminori enjoys the taste of the orb and he asks how she prepared something so delicious. Apparently all she did was tear the meat off of Omi's body and melted it down to make it easier to consume. And while I'm specifying that Fuminori is eating Omi, Saya doesn't tell Fuminori that he is. Also, this isn't the first time Saya has consumed human flesh, as she usually finds unsuspecting victims in the nearby park to munch on, and Saya has already eaten the best parts on Omi's body, proving that point is true. Having found something that Fuminori can eat, the two resolve to eat together going forward as they pack up Omi's leftovers and Tupperware and store them in the fridge. A small interlude then plays, it covering the urban legend surrounding T University Hospital. Nothing of note is learned from this scene outside of Saya's consumption of meat has no limits, as not only has she allegedly eaten cats and dogs, but also organs used for transplants and babies too. With the most pointless idol in a story ever over, we jump to the cafeteria three days after Omi's murder in the perspective of our narrator. Koji and Yo, who are sitting in the cafeteria as they regularly do, are attempting to get into contact with Omi to no avail. No one knows where she is besides us and Saya, so while Omi's parents have filed a missing persons report, some Something tells me that she won't be found. At least, not as a whole person. Koji is hopeful, as is Yo, a deep irony to be sure, though she is still rattled by her conversation with Fuminori. What was once four friends hanging out in the cafeteria is now only two. Yo asks Koji if he has already checked all the places Omi could have gone to, which he has, though he is selectively telling the truth as he doesn't say to Yo that Omi went to Fuminori's house. A bell then chimes, signaling the start of the two's next period, and while Koji gets up to leave, Yo doesn't, too sullen to head to class. Following Koji, our narrator speaks Koji's thoughts of worry, as not only is his girlfriend missing, two of his closest friends have changed for the worse. The first thing Koji did after finding out that Omi was missing was to question Fuminori, though he legitimately doesn't know what happened to her, making his denial of ever meeting her truthful, as again, he didn't know he was eating Omi or that her and Koji were listening in on him and Yo. Koji entertains the idea that Omi perhaps didn't actually go to the Sakisaka house, but his only reason for doing this is so that he doesn't have to accept the possibility that Fuminori lied to him about his involvement with her. Likewise, he told the cops what district and train station Omi went to and only that, so as to not drag Fuminori into the mix as he is still recovering. Koji wanted to help with the search, but because he doesn't know if Omi made it to Fuminori's house and the man himself denying the idea that she actually made it there, Koji's hands are tied and all he can do is accept this logic, which is about as unstable as a house of cards in a tornado. Still, suspicions towards Fuminori are growing within Koji's being, and on an off chance, Koji spots him leaving the university. Medical students have mandatory class for the day, leading to Koji wondering just where Fuminori is going so much so that he starts to follow his friend. Unexpectedly, Fuminori isn't heading home or to Tombo's office. Instead, the train that Fuminori and Koji boarded take the two to a quaint residential area. Tailing close behind, Koji, just by watching the way Fuminori moves, learns that Fuminori has been here multiple times before and it doesn't take long for him to reach his destination. 
Ogai's house. Taking cues from Omi, Fuminori enters the house without knocking on the door, and while this is still trespassing, Koji checks the mailbox to find an enormous amount of parcels, confirming the house is abandoned. Looking around for a stakeout location, Koji finds one in the form of a playground nearby. He then sits for an extended period of time overlooking the house, and when night rolls around, he spots Fuminori leaving Ogai's residence. Wanting more insight into what Fuminori was searching for, Koji follows in both his and Omi's footsteps, committing his own crime of trespassing. Welcoming Koji inside the dimly lit facsimile of a home, stale air tinged with a hint of overflowing septic tank. Not wanting to explore in the dark, Koji flicks a light switch, though nothing happens, forcing Koji to use his oil lighter. Deftly quiet is the house, but there is evidence that someone, or something, used to live there. However, that was from a long time ago, as a mountain of dust has caked everything inside, prompting Koji to assume that the resident had left with only the clothes on his bag. Letting his imagination run wild with what happened to Ogai, Koji fears that he may have stepped into the telltale heart and curses the fact that he doesn't have a mag light. Going upstairs, as Fuminori's footprints lead up there, Koji finds Ogai's study, which is lined with a vast array of books, some covering high-level medical science and research, while others containing much more esoteric knowledge. Sticking out amongst the collection is the Trait de Chief, the Ars Magna, at Ultima and the Voynik Manuscript, all three tomes related to studies in the occult. Seeing these three books causes Koji to second-guess himself as he thinks a doctor wouldn't have eldritch manuals in his private stash, but I'd be more surprised if a high-ranking doctor didn't. Putting down the incomprehensible writing, like seriously, look up the Voynik Manuscript if you don't believe me, Koji finds a horror protagonist's best friend, an L-shaped flashlight. Going off the Finder's Keeper's rule, as this is clearly Fuminori's flashlight, Koji snags it for himself. In doing so, however, Koji is able to see the used stains that are plastered all around the house with the stronger light. The sight of which causes a bit of nausea for Koji, but he doesn't let it stop him from investigating the bedroom next to the study and finding nothing of interest besides some suitcases. Descending back down the stairs, Koji once again examines the den, finding the epicenter of the slime before going to the kitchen. Though there is clearly something in the sink, Koji doesn't want to find out what it is, as it would add more fuel to his imagination, which has turned against him at this point in time. Instead, he looks towards the bathroom near the kitchen, and while his imagination is telling him that the dead body of Ogai is clearly lying in wait there, he braces himself and opens the door. What he finds is a dead body, several in fact. Coating the perimeter of the tub, a shade of obsidian is the dried blood of several small animals. Bits of flesh and bone are also housed inside the bath, though for how long is indeterminable. An irregular detail about the bones is that the meat was cleanly picked off, almost like it had been melted for easier consumption. Teeth marks on the bones prove that theory true. Racking his head around this horrid sight, Koji doesn't hear Fuminori sneak up on him until he hears his name being called out. Dosta, Koji. Turning around, Koji illuminates Fuminori's blank face before being told that he is trespassing, though such an accusation holds no weight when both parties are. Koji tells his friend such, but Fuminori, while looking inside the tub, answers that he knows the owner of the house and was asked to find something here. If we're going off that logic, that means I know Ric Flair because my friend met him once. Koji doesn't buy it for a second, asking how and who to Fuminori, but being slightly cheerful in the perverse kind of way, Fuminori tells Koji that he will personally introduce his friend to the one who saved him. Spotting that phrasing, Koji asks if this unknown person is the reason why Fuminori is acting the way he is now, though a frigid glare and a reprimanding from Fuminori beats down Koji and he doesn't get an answer. Where once a close friend stood now stands a mimic with a frozen heart. A said impersonator has returned back to his house, mentally lambasting Koji's own curiosity and describing what he did as a breach of privacy. The show of care disgusts Fuminori to the point that he concludes that if Koji is going to keep sticking his nose in where it doesn't belong, something bad is going to happen to him. Moving away from the budding murder plot that will happen later, Fuminori is shocked to find things of value at Ogai's residence, as Saya told him that he would find nothing in the abandoned sty. Though because Koji now knows where it is, gathering the important materials from there will prove to be difficult for Fuminori. A voice then rings out, breaking Fuminori out from his thoughts. Fuminori's next-door neighbor, Yosuke Suzumi, voices his concern for him as the middle-aged painter has taken notice of the declining state of the Sakisaka yard. Yosuke offers to tend to it, though Fuminori rejects the help, mentally assuming that the only reason why Yosuke would want to clean the yard is because it's an eyesore to the painter. Putting on a fake smile, Fuminori recedes back into his house, all the while complaining about people not leaving him alone. Still standing outside, Yosuke is puzzled by the oddity of Fuminori's behavior. The Fuminori Yosuke knew wasn't like the one he just interacted with, and the man wonders if the stress of living alone is causing Fuminori to develop mental problems. 
Heading back inside his house, Yosuke discusses his thoughts to his wife and daughter over dinner. The key issue the Suzumis have is the visible funk emanating from the Saki Saki yard, though Yosuke points out how secretive Fuminori is, as the storm shutters at his house have always been shut. <laughs> まさかとは思うが、生ゴミをそのまま庭に捨てているんじゃあるまいな。そんな、いくらなんでもそこまで。いや、今の様子だとやりかねん。一日中ずっと雨通し締め切って、何をやってるのかもわからない。どういう暮
isn't broken, but its lock has been undone. Anger and fear starts to grasp onto Yosuke as he switches out his palette knife he left the studio with for an ashtray, thinking that it would be a much better weapon for who, or what, ever is still in his home. Listing down the places the invader could have gone to, Yosuke checks the guest room of his house, finding it empty. Relief starts to well up in the terrified painter, but it's soon snatched away when a greasy feeler latches itself to his ankle and pulls him down. Searching for the source of the slimy tentacle, Yosuke finds it underneath the sofa and starts to frantically scream as the space between the couch and floor is so small only a creature could fit into it. His attempt to stand back up is thwarted as more appendages shoot out from the sofa and keep him held down. A gargled voice then pleads to Yosuke to calm down, and though that doesn't happen, it doesn't stop the thing underneath the couch from climbing on top of Yosuke and shoving its limbs into his brain, knocking the painter out. <laughs> While Yosuke is living through the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, Yo and Koji are meeting with Tombo to discuss Fuminori. The day Fuminori went to Ogai's house was one of his appointment days, and though Tombo tried to call him, he never picked up. When Tombo asks how Fuminori is at school, Koji responds with honest truth, causing Yo to shudder. Recognizing the duo as medical students, Tombo asks if they want to see Fuminori's charts. Koji is baffled by such a statement, but Tombo clarifies that someone has already stolen them and admits that her question was a loaded one. Though Tombo is relieved that Yo and Koji didn't steal the records, Koji's mind is racing, trying to deduce who the culprit is. Koji immediately casts blame onto Fuminori, as does Tombo, but both don't speak out their thoughts. Instead, Tombo asks for any relevant information, causing Koji to mention Ogai. Hearing his name, Tombo grimaces before explaining to Koji that Fuminori has brought up that name before. She then tells Koji, and by extension Yo, that Ogai was originally a professor at T University but was dismissed six months ago due to a series of scandals. That's all, Tombo says, as she can't elaborate on the scandals to outsiders. Seeing that as the case, Koji accuses Fuminori of being involved with Omi's disappearance in front of Yo and Tombo. Though uncomfortable with this claim, Yo lets Koji continue with his diatribe, which ends with him asking Tombo what exactly happened six months ago. This Hail Mary has mixed results, as while Tombo doesn't instantly provide an answer, she tells Koji to give her some time to do her own investigating into the matter and asks that the two exchange phone numbers to keep in contact. Back to Yosuke, his consciousness has returned. Hooray! Or it would be if he wasn't in the bowels of a sarlacc. Remember how Fuminori and I said he was lucky that he was able to come to terms with the accident before waking up in hell itself? Well, Yosuke doesn't have that luxury, and just like an unimpressive mortal staring upon the unearthly splendor of the crawling chaos, his mind crumples under sheer terror. The more Yosuke panics, the more his new surroundings overwhelm his being. No matter where he goes, all the painter sees is the rancid guts of some foul beast long forgotten to time plastic mastering everything. Yosuke somehow manages to make it back to his studio, but the sights do not change, causing him to thrash his easel into pieces, some of them lodging themselves into Yosuke's hand. Thoroughly defeated, Yosuke falls to his knees and prays to whoever will hear him. He then hears the distorted voices of his wife and daughter. Mistaking the voices as the one from before, Yosuke arms himself with one of the larger easel splinters and prepares to strike when one of the, in his head, beasts heads into the studio. Yosuke's wife is his first victim as he stabs the easel piece into her body before stomping her into red paste. Sit 
Retrieving his weapon, Yosuke then spots his daughter, who starts to run away, but he gives chase and catches her when she trips. With a newfound bloodlust, Yosuke repeatedly stabs her body to the point that it's unrecognizable. Still, the nightmare that Yosuke is in doesn't change. He only becomes more demoralized when he leaves his house. It is only when Yosuke's mental faculties have truly given out does Saya make her appearance to the broken man. Confirming our suspicions over Saya's appearance, Yosuke sees her like Fuminori, meaning that whatever Saya is, it isn't human. Wanting to make sure that is the case, Saya asks Yosuke how she looks, though in a rather creepy tone, the painter tells Saya that she looks cute. Saya pats herself on the back as her experiment was a success, but as she's doing that, Yosuke stalks his way towards her, an abhorrent idea in his mind. Though she senses something is off, Saya only starts to run away after Yosuke tears off her dress. Fueled by sadistic glee, Yosuke rushes into the Sakisaka house and corners Saya. Yosuke then proceeds to rape Saya all the while she bells out for Fuminori to save her, but he is nowhere to be seen. That's because he was out searching Ogai's house and finally found something useful, three photographs. Each photograph is of an outside location and each one of them has a different address on the back. The photos are old, but Fuminori is hoping that Saya knows where they were taken. Hurriedly returning back home to show them to Saya, Fuminori hears her cries and the sounds of F.B. Yosuke when he comes near the front door. Ice fills his veins as he darts inside his house to find a monster brutalizing Saya. Wasting no time, Fuminori picks up a nearby meat cleaver and begins to hack up Yosuke. He doesn't stop until he breaks the cleaver. With his composure regained, Fuminori hears Saya sobbing and rushes over to comfort her. Fuminori blames himself for not being there to protect Saya, but she starts apologizing to him. Pulling her into a tighter hug, Fuminori tells her that she didn't do anything wrong, but Saya admits that she did mess around with Yosuke's brain. She gave the painter the same condition that Fuminori has. This revelation baffles Fuminori, but that doesn't stop Saya from continuing her confession. Since birth, Saya has had the ability to change the inner workings of other living beings. However, to fully reshape another animal, Saya has to study them in intimate detail. By using her interactions with Fuminori and reading his record, she was able to understand his condition and recreate it with another person. Saya's reasoning for testing on Yosuke was that she wanted to have more people that would be kind to her. Remembering the trauma that he caused her upsets Saya, though Fuminori pulls her once again into a tight embrace. Running down what she has just said, Fuminori points out to Saya a misunderstanding she has. Fuminori wasn't kind to her because of the accident, but because of the time they spent together. Through her tears, a smile grows on Saya's face as the two's bond shines against the darkness. The two then share a passionate kiss. Realizing he hasn't put his emotions regarding Saya into words, Fuminori tries to speak up, but Saya cuts him off to ask what he desires the most. Since she experimented with Yosuke, she can fix Fuminori's injury, but only if he wants it. Fuminori is then given a choice, have his brain fixed or continue to live with Saya. I'll be frank here. I'm not going to cover ending one as it isn't really an ending. All that happens is that Fuminori gets cured, winds up in a mental institute for the murders of the Suzumis, and has one last conversation with Saya via text messages. Choosing to get cured doesn't even unlock the CG library, basically stating that this ending is a bad hey. ending in classical VN terms. And before I end this tangent and get back on with the recap, if a story has bad ends, I won't go over them, and if I do decide to, it'll be in this throwaway manner. Ruminating over the past few months, Fuminori wonders what he would have said to Saya if she was able to cure him on the 
same spot the day they first met. He suspects that if he did get cured, he would regret it for the rest of his life as he never would have forged a relationship with Saya. Sidestepping Saya's question, Fuminori asks who the man was, with Saya responding that he was the one from next door. Now, knowing that he killed Yosuke doesn't bother Fuminori, though it's gotten across in such a way that paints Fuminori as a misanthrope. Mainly because he takes umbrage with Yosuke complaining about the Saki Saki yard and that because the painter did that, he deserved to be experimented on by Saya. As the blood from Yosuke drips down Fuminori's face, the man comes to an epiphany over what he truly lost in the accident and that even if Saya were to cure his issue, he would never be the same person again. On his own accord, Fuminori tells Saya that no human doctor can heal him and that for Saya to claim as such would mean that she isn't human. The cat has finally been let out of the bag with Saya herself inadvertently propping up Fuminori's assertion by not directly looking at him. Accepting the truth, Fuminori placates Saya's unease by telling an analogy based around a manga character that suffered from the same predicament as Fuminori. The character in question saw regular people as rocks and robots as women and fell in love with a robot. As he is telling the tale, Fuminori is slicing off meat from Yosuke's body so he can store it for later. Saya asks if Fuminori is alright with how his life will be now, to which the man answers yes before asking about Yosuke's wife and daughter. Fuminori. Oh, sorry. I'm not in that mood right now. But if I die, it's just a meat. I don't want to kill it. I'll take it back to the store. Are you... Okay? いいよ。あと、隣の家に奥さんと娘さんがいるはずなんだ。旦那がいなくなったら騒ぐかもしれないし、通報される前に飼っとこうと思うんだな。Avoiding the question, Saya again asks if Fuminori is okay with throwing away his humanity, prompting Fuminori to finish his tale. The man in the manga did exactly that so he could be with the love of his life. In Fuminori's own words, a happy ending, but I don't know, man. I feel like a lot of context has been removed from whatever manga Fuminori is drawing from so that he can make it seem like the ending was a good one. It'd be like me saying that the ending of part one is a happy ending because Dio technically died, completely ignoring the fact that Jonathan dies and Dio resurfaces in part three. That's why context? is important. Finally able to put words to his emotions, Fuminori tells Saya that the only thing he needs is her, everything else be damned. Pulling her into another hug, Fuminori tells Saya that he loves her. Though Saya still has lingering apprehension over the two's course in life, she happily accepts Fuminori's oath. あなたのこと後悔させたくないのに。なのに。でも嬉しい。私って身勝手だよね。Both are willing to entertain the other's selfishness, a sign that, despite the two having a real love for the other, hints at how toxic this relationship is and going to be moving forward. Getting around to answering Fuminori's earlier question, Saya tells him that the wife and daughter were killed by Yosuke. That relieves Fuminori as the only thing that he and Saya have to do is pack away their meat. After doing that, Fuminori shows Saya the pictures from Ogai's house, with Saya recognizing one of them. She has been to the lodgings at Tochigi Prefecture, or as Ogai would call it, his cabin in the woods. <laughs> that brings up a question, however, why have three of these cabins? Fuminori cogitates that Ogai was doing a bit of loving it or listing it, and had picked the three cottages to determine which one would be the best lair. Looks like the one at Tochigi was the perfect candidate. Unfortunately, it's a three-hour drive from Tokyo to the hideaway. 
The professor might not even be there, as Saya has tried to call him before, but Ogai hasn't answered his phone. Taking a chance, Fuminori promises to check out the country house tomorrow, but Saya pouts at that proposition, citing the distance as the biggest factor for Fuminori not to go. <laughs> Fuminori assures her that he won't be gone for too long and that he will find her father, but it's as if Saya no longer cares about Ogai since she has Fuminori. She even tells him to forget about the professor, astonishing Fuminori and leading him to ask Saya if she is worried about her father. Saya isn't, voicing what I said two sentences ago. Ogai isn't really Saya's father, and though he did teach Saya many things about the world and loved her in his own way, their relationship was not the same as Saya's and Fuminori's. Noting the trace of loneliness in Saya's words, Fuminori asks if she is alright with just him. She is, as is Fuminori, but he honestly wants to meet Ogai as the professor must know more about Saya. <laughs> さやと二人きりじゃ。いや。でも。うん。そうだな。やっぱり王外教授には会ってみたい。さやのことをもっとよく知りたいから。僕以外にさやのことを知ってる人がいるなら、ぜひ会ってみたい。うーん、そうなんだ。there is another reason, but Fuminori doesn't say it out loud. His thoughts mention that there is a plan Fuminori wants to set in motion, though its scope is unknown at this moment. It does involve the cabin, however. Showing how observant she is, Saya inquires if Fuminori wants family and friends to spend time with. That would be preferable to Fuminori, but he quickly mentions that Saya will always be number one in his heart. The night ends with Saya formulating her own plan, but it's a mystery just like Fuminori's. Since we've been in the headspace of Fuminori for an extended period of time, the next day we catch up with our nameless narrator and Koji at T University. He just got out of his last class for the day and is heading to join Yo for lunch when he gets a phone call. Reaching for his phone, Koji chides himself for going for his new phone when it's his old phone that's ringing. Picking it up, Koji sees that it's Fuminori calling him. Uneasiness starts to worm its way into Koji, but he answers the phone. Fuminori, who knows that Koji is finished with school for the day, wants to speak to Koji out in the parking lot right now. A flood of different emotions hit Koji, but he ultimately decides to go to the parking lot where, true to his word, Fuminori is waiting. It has been a while since the two have last had an encounter, but with the two standing in the light this time, Koji can definitely tell Fuminori has changed. Where once a tense expression laid is now now replaced with a calm demeanor, yet under the surface of Fuminori's relaxed attitude, Koji knows something is up. Being selectively upfront as only he knows what he's planning, Fuminori asks if Koji can help him with the investigation into Ogai. Asking a question of his own, Koji inquires into Fuminori's change of heart, but all the man says that Koji doesn't have a choice seeing as he looked around Ogai's suburban house as well. Though Koji is aware of the malice dripping behind Fuminori's mask, he does abide by Fuminori's request of needing a lift to the cabin and starts his accord. This is in spite of Koji being gobsmacked over how far away Fuminori's destination is. While the most awkward car ride is about to kick off, we spectate alongside our narrator over what Yo is doing. She's impatiently wondering where Koji is and letting her own loneliness overrun her existence. Sounds like Yo shares something in common amongst two characters we deeply know. Going over the events of the previous two weeks, Yo starts to realize that, yeah, Koji's and Omi's actions weren't coincidental. However, Yo takes this newfound information and starts blaming herself for Omi's disappearance as it's the only thing Yo thinks she can do. A text message breaks Yo out of her self-loathing, but the sender of it is Omi, a logical impossibility. Of course, Yo doesn't know that, but the message that Omi sent telling Yo to come to the Sakisaka house by herself is lacking the woman's personality. Yo shoots a text back asking if the person sending the messages is Omi, and while she waits to receive a response, Yo's mind tries to reach a conclusion over who has Omi's phone and why they are sending texts to Yo. 
She also panics a little bit inside as whoever has Omi's phone has access to the many private conversations that Yo had with Omi. No doubt about Fuminori. Speaking of him, Yo gets another message, this one asking her if she wants to know about Fuminori. Having no doubt in her mind anymore, Yo knows she's not talking to Omi, causing the downtrodden girl to fall back into self-loathing. Not knowing what to do, Yo starts to dial Koji's number, but a dreadful thought prevents her from doing so. The one with Omi's phone might be nearby, watching Yo's every move. The earlier messages read more like a threat now. Indecisiveness coils around Yo like a boa as she would much rather run away than face whoever has the phone, but Yo knows that if she does run away, she could never live it down. Facing her cowardice head on, Yo arrives at the front gate of the Sakisaka residence, unaware of the scheme that she has fallen into. A deluge of ideas pour inside Yo's mind as she attempts to ring the intercom, but unlike the last person who did it, Yo does get a proper entry into the house per the words of the newest message she receives. This startles Yo and she starts to look for the voyeur spying on her, spotting movement on the second floor bedroom of the house. Cowardice once again rises up in Yo to the point that she starts sobbing uncontrollably, forcing the unseen watcher to send another message. Not looking at it, Yo instead trudges into the house. The first thing that hits her is the stench, followed by the lack of light within the foreboding cage. Surveying the main hall, Yo finds out that Fuminori isn't in as his shoes are missing from the shoe cupboard, but that doesn't catch Yo's attention like her next discovery, Omi's shoes are in the cupboard. Yo tries to deny that the shoes are Omi's, but with some uncharacteristically quick thinking, Yo learns that they are when she speed dials Omi's phone and hears it reverberate throughout the gloom. It's centered on the bedroom, but it doesn't beep for long as Saya catches onto Yo's gamble and quickly silences the device. Taking a move from Omi's playbook, Yo calls out into the pitch black recesses of the residency, but no one answers. Arduously making her climb up the stairs towards the bedroom, Yo preoccupies her mind with thoughts far away from the situation she's found herself in while calling out for Omi and Fuminori. Reaching the chamber, Yo slowly enters, finding the room void of anything save for the debilitating artwork of a loon. Ambushing Yo at the exact moment her spirit has withered away, Saya sends her tendrils out to restrain Yo. What makes matters worse is that Saya also forcibly tears Yo's breasts free from her blouse and starts to fondle them. Horrified by what is happening to her, Yo tries to break free, but Saya's clinch is like steel, rendering Yo unable to get away. However, Saya lets go of Yo, though she used up all her energy in the struggle, leaving Yo defenseless. The only action she can take is to not look at the blob that attacked her, as doing so would decimate any remaining sanity Yo has left. Saya, on the other hand, types out a message for Yo, which turns out to be an unwarranted and quite vulgar compliment on her body. Pushed over the edge, Yo curls into the fetal position, an action which earns a cruel laugh from Saya. The last lines of the message expose Saya as a green-eyed monster, as she believed Yo was trying to steal Fuminori away by using her body. Wanting to defile that body, Saya rapes Yo, sneering at her rival's misery when Yo cries out for help. Drawing closer and closer to oblivion, Yo hears the voice of a girl exuding equal auras of innocence and maliciousness, telling her that she isn't going to die. Instead, Yo will suffer a much worse fate, joining the Sakisaka family. Elsewhere, the most maladroit carpool is still going on. Fuminori has closed himself off from conversation, leaving Koji high and dry. He does take an extended peek at Fuminori's face, but he still can't decipher the warnings that he's getting from his former best friend. What frightens Koji the most is how determined Fuminori is, almost like he's not going to let anyone stop him from creating the future he wants. Wanting to gauge a reaction from Fuminori, Koji brings up Omi. Despite Fuminori saying that he's worried, his tone of voice ascertains that he isn't, something that Koji calls Fuminori out on. This puts Fuminori on the defensive, but he still asserts that he doesn't know where Omi is. Frustrated to the point of wanting to pummel Fuminori, Koji can only think of one word to describe him, callous. If Koji was dealing with the old, frightful Fuminori, he could just beat answers out of him, but this new one is fearless and, worst of all, sneaky when it comes to his intentions. Perhaps killing Yosuke brought about this evolution to Fuminori's character. Continuing the discussion, Koji tells Fuminori that Omi did see what played out in the courtyard, and for a brief moment, Fuminori puts on a show of sympathy for Yo. 
Koji, however, takes it as pity, and though he is wrong to do so, as our narrator points out Fuminori's mournful smile with how he has been acting, it makes sense that Koji takes it as such. Still, Fuminori doesn't do himself any favors with what he says next about Yo. The rest of the car ride is in silence until the dynamic duo try to locate the isolated road the cabin is on. Fuminori is the one who cites it, and even though Koji is baffled at the state of said road, when he is given the photograph, he confirms that they found it. At the end of the lonely path lies an equally forlorn log cabin. Making haste, not waste, Fuminori is out of Koji's Honda Accord quicker than you can scold me for using such a boomer saying. Following right behind with a flashlight in tow, Koji searches the decrepit lodge alongside Fuminori. Experiencing flashbacks to his previous search at a rundown dump, Koji finds two things. Jack and shit. That's because this cabin only contains the bare essentials for living. Almost as if the house looking plain was the point. Exiting the chalet, Koji finds a locked door buried into the ground and kicks it open, just like how Fuminori did with the front door, uncovering a set of stairs leading downward towards the basement. Yet, it too is devoid of any clues. Koji's distrust of Fuminori reaches its zenith as he begins to hypothesize that Fuminori is just lying about Ogai being at the house. The last place that Koji examines is the backyard, with the only notable thing back there being a well that has no bucket or pulley and is dried up. Leaning over it, Koji tries to determine why Ogai needed a cabin in the middle of nowhere. Fuminori's statement from earlier, the one about how Ogai needed a place that was away from nosy meddlers, replays in Koji's mind and helps him connect the dots. The house is an obvious mock-up. Gleaning that, Koji calls Tombo to see if she knows anything about this mysterious shelter, but all he gets is voicemail. Reckoning that this is the only chance he'll get to send out a call to Tombo while Fuminori is prowling around, Koji leaves a message and then hangs up. Koji is still worried that Tombo won't be of any help, as both he and Yo are unable to decide if she could be trusted, but Tombo is the only beacon that Koji can look towards at the moment. This stray assessment reminds Koji that he didn't tell Yo about his change of plans for the day, but when he calls her number, there is a delay before she picks it up. On the other end of the line, Koji hears an odd squelching noise, but as it turns out, it's Yo sobbing. In a hysteric tone, Koji asks if his friend is alright, to which Yo answers in a pained voice that she was attacked by a monster. That's not the worst of it, however, as Yo exclaims that her body is falling apart. Yo expresses that she's melting, and even tells Koji that her ear is now gone and her fingers have shaped themselves into, well, something that isn't fingers. Koji curses the fact that he can't do anything besides listen to Yo's pleas and recommend that she call the cops. That idea gets snuffed out though as Yo doesn't want anyone else to find her in such a crude state. She starts to hack up what appears to be a lung, but Koji doesn't hear the rest of that because Fuminori has snuck up on him and knocked the phone out of his hands. 
pressing the advantage, Fuminori thrusts Koji into the well. The fall doesn't kill Koji, though that isn't necessarily a good thing. Koji tries to raise his voice against his attacker, but he can barely get out a groan. Mocking Koji's painful fall, Fuminori throws Koji's phone down the well, but it is lacking its battery pack. Wanting an explanation, Koji's hamster brain spins in its wheel fast enough for him to understand that Fuminori brought him out here to kill him. The fall was meant to kill Koji, but it looks like time is going to have to fulfill that job now. Not that Fuminori cares, his friend's death is set in stone. He did have an alternative method he was planning to use as Koji picks up the phrase might as well during Fuminori's explanation for why he attacked Koji, but he saw the well and thought, yeah, that seems like a neat way to kill someone. <laughs> せっかく人目につかないところまで出かけるんならついでにと思ってさついでにってお前そんな理由で俺を this reasoning doesn't satisfy Koji, but Fuminori backfires by saying that sometimes people die for no reason, and if Koji wants one, he has all the time in the world to come up with a reason. His deed finished, Fuminori leaves Koji to his fate, unaware of Gyo's dilemma. We too also leave Koji to join Fuminori, who feels great after his murder that was so perfect that it possibly couldn't fail. To Fuminori, it's like he finished a thousand-piece puzzle or pulled off a sweet combo in Yu-Gi-Oh. He's in such a good mood that he doesn't care about how long his trip back to Tokyo is going to be, as it's not like he can use Koji's car without any risk. Taking the long trek home, Fuminori recounts his plan in full detail. He correctly guessed that Ogai wouldn't be at Tochigi, meaning the cabin would be completely deserted, allowing him to commit his murder. Though in his original plan, Fuminori was going to hack up Koji with a meat cleaver, but when he saw the well, he called an audible. On a whim, just like Koji reckoned. The only person left for Fuminori to remove is Yo, but he's completely unaware that she has already been taken care of. Granted, Fuminori is also oblivious that Koji left a message for Tombo, so he actually has another person to deal with unbeknownst to him. Climbing off the mountainside, Fuminori takes the nearest train back to Tokyo and attempts to draft a plan to kill Yo, but he can't come up with one before he reaches his residence. Entering his home, Fuminori is welcomed back by Saya. Owing an apology to the girl, Fuminori begins to tell Saya why he's so late getting back from Ogai's cabin, but he gets cut off when Saya tells him that she's almost finished with preparations. That word confuses Fuminori, but all Saya does is smile and ask if he wants dinner, bath, or... You know the joke. Fuminori chooses bath first as he's been out for the entire night, with Saya joining him so she can be regaled by the tale of his night out. Also in the bath, Fuminori informs Saya that the only person he has left to deal with is Yo, but he hasn't thought of a way to kill her. Already in the know, Saya tells Fuminori to leave Yo to her, earning an incredulous response from Fuminori. Finished taking their shared bath, Saya orders Fuminori to close his eyes as she leads him towards the upstairs bedroom. He does open them when he hears the sounds of someone whimpering, but quick as a whippet, Saya reams Fuminori for disobeying her commands. After being told that it isn't anything dangerous, Fuminori closes his eyes once again, wondering who did Saya let into the house. When he's finally standing face to face to the source of the voice, Saya directs Fuminori to open his eyes, allowing him to see that it was Yo who was weeping. Lust instantly hits Fuminori as Yo has been chained inside the bedroom with Neria fabric on her, but questions follow it. Stepping up to answer them, Saya discloses that she transformed Yo into the same species that she is, also that Fuminori could love Yo. This blows Fuminori's mind, though it shouldn't as Saya has told him before that she can morph the human body. It pays to listen, Fuminori, something he's shockingly shit at. I say this in jest, but Saya does follow this statement with something that is quite quizzical. Whatever the range of her powers, changing the body types of other living creatures is how they were meant to be used. And odder still is that Yo was Saya's first test run on a human to this degree. Fuminori still can't believe that he's seen Yo until she, through glassy eyes, looks at him. Continuing her spiel, Saya boasts that out of everyone on the planet, she knows the most about the anatomy of Homo sapiens. This is thanks in part to Fuminori's seed. They do call it that for a reason. 
By analyzing the DNA inside of it, Saya was able to almost completely understand the human body. Specifying almost, Saya's job on Yo didn't go perfectly as Yo doesn't know how to operate her new body because of her broken mind. She's the equivalent of a scared animal, or as Saya puts it, a gift. Fuminori did want family and friends after all. Thinking about the logistics of keeping a person hostage, Fuminori worries about the upkeep for Yo, but Saya tells him not to, pulling at the chain to show that Yo isn't going anywhere. Not like she could anyway. Conceding to Saya, Fuminori is still trying to figure out what she means by gifting Yo to him. Saya takes this as Fuminori being unhappy with her actions, but he stifles out that his concern is based around Saya being jealous of Yo living with the two. Upon hearing that, Saya clears the air by telling Fuminori to not overthink things. Fuminori still has conflicting feelings as he doesn't want to be aroused by Yo's body, but Saya gives him the go-ahead to be as long as she joins in with the fun. Though he does try to get her to reconsider, Fuminori is rebuffed by a smiling Saya, a smile permeating with ill intent and envy, telling them that they are lovers and Yo is their pet. <laughs> ミノリとサヤは恋人同士で筑波陽はそんな二人のペットこの子は私とフミノリに可愛がられるためにそのことを思い出すのこれから毎日ずっとね Witnessing the full brunt of Saya's dark side only makes Fuminori love her more, and even his thoughts speak on how human-like Saya has become. Accepting this gift, Fuminori, alongside Saya, molests Yo. When the two are finished with the act, the family settles in for the night, but ever as philosophical, Fuminori ruminates on everything before him, most importantly, Saya. He wants to know what she is and asks her, half expecting to not get an answer, but Saya does provide one in the form of a flowery metaphor. Saya is a dandelion. Small and weak, but if given enough love and care from at least one person, it can turn even a desert into an oasis.風に運ばれて、ふるさとから遠く遠く離れて、もしかしたら草木なんか一本も生えてない砂漠に落ちちゃうかもしれない。そんな時、たった一粒のその種が何を思うか。それを想像してくれれば分かってもらえるかもしれない私のこと種はもちろん草の種だからねその気になって頑張れば砂漠を砂漠じゃなくしてしまえるただ一粒だけの種でももしかしたら
頑張ろうって思うようになるかもしれない頑張って育って増えていつかこの土地が一面のタンポポ畑になるまで頑張ろうってそう思うかもしれない<音楽>そんなふうにタンポポの種が心を決めるとしたらどんな時だと思う<音楽>それは<音楽>それはねその砂漠にたった一人だけでも。花を愛してくれる人がいるって知った時タンポポの花は綺麗だねって種に話しかけてくれた時<笑>あなたのこと大好き。ずっとそばにいていつまでも私の隣にあもちろん As the Saki Sakas are enjoying their new freedom, Koji is inching one step closer to becoming roommates with Sadako. Death has him within its threshold, and the only thing Koji can do is think of the memories he made during his time in the coil. Dreams and memories mix together as his mind deteriorates just like cars, but Koji is brought back from the edge by the sound of a running engine. Knowing that whoever this person is that has arrived is his only chance of rescue, Koji desperately bells out to catch their attention, completely disregarding how raw his throat has become. This pays off as the person, Tombo, looks down the well and calls to him. Needing some equipment to get Koji out, Tombo heads back to her car as Koji tests to see how damaged his body has become. Despite some aches and numbness, Koji can still move. Returning back to the mouth of the well, Tombo throws down a rope and asks if Koji can climb it on his own. He cannot, spurring Tombo to go down the well herself. Upon seeing that Tombo is his savior, Koji is stupefied. No wonder he and Fuminori were best friends, they both have awful short term memory. That said, Tombo is clad in survival gear and carrying an electric lamp as opposed to a flashlight, so his bewilderment isn't entirely out of place. It's like she stepped out of Call of Cthulhu or any other property connected to the cosmic horror genre. Pulling a flask out from her large coat, Tombo orders Koji to slowly sip from it. Tasting the liquid, Koji reels from how potent it is. Tombo gets a slight kick from Koji's reaction to the spiritus vodka and alcohol she always carries on her person due to its many uses. Just like with Fuminori, Koji tries to hazard a guess as to why Tombo is acting completely different from the way she does at the hospital, and he does get around to asking why she came to the cabin, scolding him as if If he was a child, Tombo sharply reminds Koji that he did call her. When she called back, Tombo didn't get an answer and assumed the worst. Painfully recalling the recent developments regarding Fuminori and Yo, Koji's rage rises just enough to the surface that Tombo can see it and upbraid him for it, as getting upset now won't solve this case. Neither will the police, but before Koji can learn why, Tombo finds a secret entrance at the bottom of the well. Tombo chides herself for not discovering it earlier, indirectly bringing to light that not only does she have a history of Ogai, but she's been to Tochigi before. Koji picks up on this and wants answers, but Tombo is too enthralled with the long corridor leading out of the well. Whatever Tombo is searching for at the dwelling, it's at the end of the passage, but she doesn't want Koji to come into contact with the world that she has to deal with. Flipping between the rope and the hall, Koji asks to be brought along with Tombo humoring him. The two travel the length of the underground passage and share a conversation along the way. Koji mainly tries to figure out the enigma that is known as Ryoko Tombo, but she isn't having it as Koji doesn't need to learn information that is far above his brain's comprehension. A small finding is made partway through the shaft, a stretch of rope that has a knot in it. Ogai would have used it to enter the well and tunnel without leaving any evidence behind. That's why Ryoko didn't make any advancements in her quest. Needing some form of sanity that he can latch onto, Koji doesn't get it when he asks Tombo for clarification concerning her trips to the shanty. 
ante. Instead, he witnesses Tombo pulling out his sawn-off double barrel. She means to splatter Ogai with it, as she wasn't able to do so in the past. In conclusion, Tombo is trying to rectify the present and future because of her past mistakes. あの時にこいつがあったなら私は多分王外をきっちり殺せていただろう。そうなってれば、もしかしたら君たちがこんな災難に巻き込まれることもなかったかもしれない。その点はもし訳ないと思ってるよ。ああ。だから、これから私がや
Partaking in the food as soon as he is inside the car, Koji breathes a sigh of relief knowing that he has two phones. Picking up his old one, Koji calls Fuminori. A verbal tete-a-tete -tete ensues, Koji landing the first blow with swagger. Placed on the back foot by a dead man, Fuminori wants to know how Koji survived. This turns out to be a foolish question, however, as Koji phrases what he is saying in such a way that completely takes over the war of words. Reminding himself of Tombo's words and their boreal connotation, Koji switches the topic of the conversation to Omi and Yo, swearing that he will look the other way if Fuminori promises to stop inducing torment to those around him. Caught with red hands, Fuminori admits that he had nothing to do with Omi, but Yo is currently with him and won't want to leave. Taking his own turn to land a punishing straight, Fuminori calls Yo his property and that Koji and Omi finally got their wish granted. <laughs> Stung by that, Koji closes out the battle by telling Fuminori that if he releases Yo, Koji will leave him alone. Hoping that Fuminori buys into the bluff and with time against him, Koji races back to Tokyo. In the city, Fuminori, who's being pleasured by a now talking Yo, constructs a plan of attack to deal with Koji. Staying at the Sakisaka house would be a poor defensive option, thus Fuminori opts to leave the nest and find a new one. Saya, when told of this strategy, is reluctant to go with this idea, but knows that it's the only option the two have. Up and still sifting through the notes at the wee hours of the morning is Tombo, thinking whatever gods that Ogai didn't trust them com- Computers for data entry. He believed in old-fashioned pen and paper as well as obscuring the structure of his work. The piles upon piles of paper containing Ogai's life's work were scrambled with a strange writing pattern, but because of her own deranged perseverance, Tombo not only figured out how it worked, but also restored a few volumes of it. In the notes, Ogai details his time with an alien who had an appetite for information. Despite this, however, the subject, which Ogai refers to as a he for the time being, didn't identify as an individual. It lacked an ego. Yet, even without a soul, the creature learned the human tongue in such a short manner that it could freely talk with Ogai. Not that he learned anything about where it came from, Ogai hypothesizes that the he only gained sentience after it materialized in our world. Another conclusion Ogai theorizes is that the creature was made by an even more intelligent race as a sort of spy drone. Whatever the case, speech wasn't the only thing the alien was good at, as it excelled at numbers two, calculating many unfound mercen primes. Out of all the subjects in the world, however, biology interested the creature the most, particularly reproduction. It's as if that interest was born out of instinct. Such an instinct that drives it to consume the sperm of other living animals, denoting the creature as female. That's not all, though as she started creating a personality, indicating to Ogai that she might have birthed a soul. On the day of her birthday, Ogai christened the outsider as Saya. When given the semen of other beasts, Saya is able to mold them to how she sees fit, what Ogai proposes to be her purpose in life. This proposal instills fear into Tombo, who starts frantically searching for the notes on Saya's biology as she doesn't have much time left before Koji reaches Tokyo. I would argue that she has no time because Koji has already pulled up near the Sakisaka house and is beginning endgame. Storming the house, Koji is the third person assaulted by the vile Redolin smothering the hovel. Unlike the previous entrants who entered the hellhole, the Malodor only heightens Koji's senses. Making a cursory examination of the dump, Koji learns that there's no one else in the house, but if there was, he would have used the revolver a consolation that worries Koji. He doesn't let it get to him, however, as then he would fall to fear. Focusing on his hunt, Koji enters the living room to see the full bearing of Fuminori's psychological decline. Dolor constrains Koji's person at the sight of the pain bedamming himself for his own powerlessness to comfort Fuminori a half-truth to be candid. Immigrating towards the kitchen, Koji confronts the apex of the stench, the refrigerator. Mustering up all the courage he has, Koji opens it and can only stare blankly at the various organs and limbs stored inside. Any remnants of his previous life have been fully atomized. Consoling his gun, Koji knows that he's not going to kill Fuminori for revenge or justice, but to reassure himself that reason exists within the world. A two-pronged path makes itself known to Koji. Either call Fuminori, 
or Tombo. Letting his cooler head prevail, Koji rings up Tombo to inform her what has happened at the Sakisaka residence. In turn, Tombo, while thankful that Koji's mistake wasn't a fatal one, instructs Koji to stay put while she extracts more information from Ogai's work, as Saya isn't exactly something that can be put down easily. The two make their break for the moment, deciding to reconvene in Tokyo at midnight to discuss their plan. At the same time, Fuminori and Saya are making their own preparations. The group of three has moved to an abandoned mental asylum in the boonies far away from the hustle and bustle of regular people. Fuminori has also purchased an axe, which, under his corrupted vision, looks like a devil arm. Too bad Fuminori has only killed one person, meaning the bonus attack he gets with it is so minuscule he's better off using the Gaia Cleaver. Still, Saya tries to get Fuminori to test out the weapon on Yo, but he refuses to do so, indicating that because Yo looks like a human, he can't bring himself to harm her. Something that Fuminori is relying on, as Koji might hesitate to kill Fuminori because he's human, while Fuminori won't because people to him look like bulbs of flesh. That's in theory, mind you, as Saya makes clear. Clear. She would much rather preempt Koji from the shadows, but Fuminori doubts her strength. It's not that Saya isn't weak, it's that her efficiency in combat is based on the element of surprise. Those who can grasp her true form are people already lost to the throes of delirium can easily step up to Saya. Her appearance could even incite the opposite effect that she would want, as some people react to fear with fury. Either way, both Fuminori and Saya's ideas are based on human reaction, which is so vacuous that it's almost impossible to plan around. Just then, a flash of inspiration hits Fuminori, though he shares the newfound stratagem with his muse in secret. Done with planning out what their actions are going to be when the fated time comes, Fuminori and Sai have another issue at hand. How will they get food? There's no refrigerator at the sanitarium, and while there are wild animals nearby, overhunting would be an issue. His new shelter is just that, a temporary place of stay. Yet, the two are together on this journey, so it's not all bad for the Sakisakas. And if Saya is to go off of, soon the world will be a place fit for Saya and Fuminori. Expediting this change will be Saya's last present to Fuminori, or in her words, her first and last duty for the world. それは明日かもしれないし、ずっとずっと先のことかもしれない。いつ印が来るのか私にもわからないの。僕らにも希望があるのかい。うん。Escaping the asylum, we return back to Koji, who is spending his time seeing the sights of Tokyo and waxing poetic over the world he has left behind. When the appointed time arrives, Koji heads to a 24-hour diner for his meeting with Tombo, but she doesn't appear until an hour past midnight. She is carrying a heavy duffel bag, most definitely the secret weapon the two will use against Saya. Sitting down across from Koji, Tombo and he have a lengthy conversation going over their game plan and Saya. Tombo does try to dissuade Koji from continuing down this path of destruction, but Koji is a roaring river only capable of heading in one direction. Likewise, Koji has reasons to distrust Tombo since she won't help herself, but if you ask me, they're both dummies with personal grudges.君にとってこの事件はムニの親友がいきなり勝共を失ってカニバリズムに目覚めたっていうただそれだけの内容なんだろ それだけじゃないとしたら、残りは先生の妄想なんじゃないですか。そう思えるならまだ君の傷は浅いってことさ。<音楽><音楽> 
今ならまだ時間が君の傷を癒してくれるだろう君は最後の一線を踏み越えていない先生の傷は俺よりも深いと。この銃はね、実家の父のものなんだ。こいつがロッカーから消えたせいで父は責任を問われて地元の猟友会から除名させられた申し訳ないと思ってるよ私は両親にとっては自慢の娘なんだそれが金庫の銃を盗み出すなんて想像もしてないだろうそうするだけの必要が先生にはあったといいや全然。その頃にはもう、ういのことは一見落着していた。少なくとも私はそう思っていた。やつは姿を消したきり、もう二度と私の前には現れないだろうと安心してた。この銃で何かを撃とうとか、殺そうとか、そういう必要があったわけじゃない。じゃあなぜ眠れなかったんだよただそれだけ<音楽>それまではベッドサイドになたを隠しておいたんだ夜一人で部屋にいるのが耐えられなくてねどんなに世界が底抜けにめちゃくちゃになっていこうと悲鳴を上げて逃げ回る以外の選択肢が自分にはあるんだってそう納得させるためにはね部屋の中に何か一つ頼りになる武器を置いておきたかったああ でもそれじゃ大した効き目はなかった悪夢は日ごとにひどくなっていく一方で安眠するにはナタじゃまだ足りなかったんだそれで父の銃を盗んできたこんな風に重心を詰めるとね残弾がもっと広範囲に飛び
この先すべてを先生に任せろというのなら先生のことを信用させてください先生をそこまで追い詰めるほどのものが王外っていう男にあったという証拠を彼が何をしでかしたのかすべて俺に見せてくださいそこまで言うかねまったく。Wanting to show off her trustworthiness, Tombo hands Koji a part of Ogai's documents and tells him what happened at the university prior to Ogai disappearing. The professor brought live specimens mutated by Saya to the campus and even stole equipment from T Uni to continue his work. When the board caught wind of that, they pushed down the severity of the situation but had the staff of the hospital exterminate any of Ogai's experiments. Everyone chose to forget what had happened except for Tombo, who decided to hunt down Ogai and his conspirators. That's when reason was lost to Tombo. The only thing she And by extension, Koji can trust in are the words of Ogai in relation to Saya. Slashing and piercing does nothing to her kind's body as they can instantly regenerate those types of wounds, but Tombo assumes that freezing her will do the trick. Koji couldn't care less as his focus is Fuminori, but he and Tombo do manage to reach an agreement between themselves and officially form their alliance. With the go ahead, Koji calls Fuminori to learn where the meeting place for their destined showdown will be. Fuminori doesn't give an exact location, instead, he tells Koji a coordinate. Taking Koji's car, he and Tombo, who is hiding in the trunk so Fuminori doesn't know Koji has help, follow Fuminori's list of directions until they arrive at the sanitarium. Popping the trunk at the same time he opens the car door, Koji begins quietly making his way inside the wrecked asylum. Greeting Koji besides the ever present darkness is a pulpy, squishy noise. When he tunes his ear to focus on it, Koji can make out that it's labored breathing, but he moves in closer to examine it better. Obviously, it's the cries of Yo, but when Koji asks into the Abyss, he doesn't get an immediate answer. Having already given away his position by talking, Koji sees no wrong with turning his flashlight on, but before he does so, Yo does call back. She begs to Koji for him to kill her, but he can't believe the thing that he is talking to is Yo and thus decides to turn on the flashlight. Encountering a true horror that normal human minds can't even begin to fathom, Koji's reason falters as he unloads the remaining four rounds of an Ogai's revolver into Yo. The damage is negligible, though she does complain about the pain. Out of bullets, Koji stumbles to the floor where Yo starts to grab onto him. Quickly searching for an improvised weapon, Koji finds one in the form of a pipe and uses it to bash Yo into chunky red salsa. This isn't an exaggeration, he hits her around 40 times with the pipe, Yo dying after the 20th blow. The monster dead, Koji recovers just enough to be reminded of Tombo's warning. She did say that Koji hadn't seen the most damning part of this, but now he has. 
All Koji has left for himself is despair and hate, the most cruel and voracious of companions. Only when Koji has fallen to his lowest does Fuminori attempt a sneak attack. It fails, forcing him to directly confront Koji. At long last, the two former friends have a proper confrontation. Koji has the advantage for most of the fight as he has been in fights before, but that changes when Koji tries to land the killing blow. Saya stops Koji from slamming his pipe into Fuminori's face, giggity, but before she can kill Koji, Tombo does a run-in and blasts her with a shotgun. While Saya is really Tombo hands Koji the thermos of liquid nitrogen that she had in the duffel bag earlier and orders him to dump it onto Saya. Seizing the only chance he has to do so, Koji unscrews the lid of the thermos and chucks it at Saya, landing a direct hit. The Sub-Zero element decimates most of Saya's mass, but as Tombo is celebrating, Fuminori staggers over to the doctor. Shifting her focus onto him, Tombo points her shotgun right at Fuminori, but when she pulls the trigger, the gun jams. Improper shell storage is to blame, and while she quickly loads another shell in, she isn't fast enough to prevent Fuminori from cleaning leaving into her. Neither is Koji as he is stuck to the floor because of some residual liquid nitrogen. Suffering a mortal wound, Tombo doesn't have long left, but she has just enough time to aim her shotgun towards Saya and shatter a large chunk of her body into crystals. A tranquil emptiness washes over Fuminori at the sight of his beloved dying. The serene state that Fuminori is in has such an effect on Koji that he can't attack the man he swore he hated. Pulling the axe out of Tombo's body, Fuminori repeatedly plants his head into the edge, unable to go on living without Saya.
Silence deafens the building until Saya feebly makes her way over to Fuminori's body. Anger fills Koji at the sight of this as if a little piece of him still wants to see Fuminori as his friend, but despite raining down heavy impacts with his pipe, Koji is unable to stop Saya from reaching her lover and caressing his body. She then dies. <laughs> In the end, Koji, despite his dislike of Tombo, ends up becoming her, suffering from hellacious nightmares and lifelike hallucinations. It was a pointless journey for Koji as the cops discovered the remains inside Fuminori's fridge, condemning him as a murderer in the public eye. The only thing Koji can look forward to is death, whether by natural causes or by his own hand. And yet, this is just one possibility that this story might end. As they say, let's do the time warp again and go back to that fork in the road of Koji's life. Overcome with indignation, Koji calls Fuminori. A confident Fuminori picks up as he knows Koji is at his house when he hears a phone ring in the background. Squandering his advantage, the only thing Koji can do is reluctantly follow Fuminori's orders, which is to arrive at Ogai's residential home at 7. The scene that plays after with Fuminori and Saya discussing their plan is much of the same in the other timeline except for when they submit their strategy. Fuminori does reveal that he's going to be sending Koji all over Nippon to lower his morale before finishing him off at the asylum. Doing as he was told, Koji is on a fool's errand at Ogai's house as when Seven rolls around, Fuminori calls him to tell him the actual meeting spot. Everything that happens in the asylum is the same, just without Tombo except for when Saya grabs onto Koji. Having no backup, Koji's neck is twisted like a bottle cap by Saya, leaving him dead. Reflecting on the two's victory, Fuminori's sense of accomplishment is replaced with unending dread when he sees Saya writhing in pain. Though he has broken ribs, Fuminori muscles through the pain to tend to her. Promised time is now, an event that Saya has prophesied before. She wasn't expecting it to be so soon, however. Fuminori doesn't understand, but Saya tells him that she has decided to do her best, all because Fuminori showed her love. This doesn't assuage Fuminori's angst, but what does is Saya's declaration of being pregnant and about to give birth. With a soft voice, Saya commands Fuminori to take her outside, which he obliges. Once outside, Saya reveals her last gift to Fuminori, the Earth. In a brilliant display, flower-like wings spring forth from Saya's body as if she bloomed. Vast amounts of tiny particles fly off these wings and spread across the world to sing the Song of Saya. With it comes the death of the old world and the birth of a new one free from all the ugliness that festered with no restraint.
さよならなのか、うん、違うこれは始まり。An unspecified amount of time passes from this event, enough time for Tombo to finish restoring all of Ogai's work. She no longer hates Ogai, instead admiring his scientific findings. It's not like anyone else will for reasons I will get to later. Congratulating her work with the last drop of vodka in her flask, Tombo reads the last few pages of Ogai's notes. Saya showed up in our world for a reason, to reproduce. Whatever species Saya is, their main goal is to enter other dimensions and procreate with the most abundant life form natural to it. Doing that, Saya's race genetically alters the dominant species into more Sayas. The reason why Saya and her sisters are so focused on information is so that they can inherit the host species culture. In fact, Saya's race preys on intelligent life as developed races are more likely to dip their toes into forbidden knowledge. While still reading the completed work, Tombo leaves the cabin to get a more scenic view of the world around her. The last lines of Ogai's notes mention his befuddlement over Saya choosing not to bloom after acquiring sufficient data. It's because she developed a fickle, sometimes righteous, sometimes unfair, human aspect called a soul. Romance became a driving point for Saya and without it she saw no reason to carry out her duty. Ogai blames himself for this development, but I would argue that Saya was doomed as soon as she emerged into our world. Such is the infectious nature of humanity. Tombo wishes she could have met Saya as glorious as a being as she was, and even acknowledges that she sorta played matchmaker for her and Fuminori. The last of Ogai's notes close out with him asking Saya for forgiveness and that one day she will find love. A love that will bring rebirth to a horrid world. Finished with the manuscript, Tombo examines her own future as she has yet to change into one of Saya's children. Perhaps because she stayed up near the mountain, Saya's spores had a much slower effect on Tombo, and while she has already cut off one of her own hands that was transforming Cheops to sleep until her mutation has completed. The last thoughts on Tombo's mind are of booze, hoping that she will still like it after her change. The Sorrowful Song of Saya is a tale about the complexities of human nature. At times, the human soul can be the most wonderful of things. It allows us to experience love, joy, and hope. In that same breath, however, the human soul can make us vindictive monsters, transforming us to the point that we fail to see with reason and instead give in to hate, rage, and despair. Every character on the cast is fallible to such a human degree, even when their actions or state of being are far from it. At the center of the story is the relationship between Fuminori, a man who has lost everything, and Saya, a creature born with nothing. It makes sense why the two of them would be attracted to each other. Loneliness is the most contemptible emotion anyone could come to blows with. It is better to face direct pain and suffer for a brief moment than to endure 
endure isolation and wallow for eternity. Just look at Castaway. Chuck Nolan speaks to Wilson so he won't be crushed underneath loneliness's all-encompassing gravity. And while Fuminori and Saya's relationship was born out of necessity, it lasted as long as it did because of the genuine emotional connection they were able to make. Such is the nature of the human soul. Two wildly different people can not only come together, but grow close due to shared trauma and even overcome it together. Yet, this is not to say that both Fuminori and Sai are entirely innocent in their actions or that their love doesn't have issues. A lot of what Fuminori and Saya wind up going through is ultimately because of their love. Fuminori ends up receding into madness because instead of working on bettering himself, he actively rejects any outside help unless it's from Saya. Vice versa, Saya does help Fuminori, but it's made clear that she'll do anything to have Fuminori all to herself, making her unreliable when it comes to the truth. Both characters engage with this latter issue, though it's brought up from a very human place. For Fuminori, it's fear. For Saya, it's jealousy and fear. Multiple points are made by Fuminori that he can't reveal his condition to others, lest he be stricken away from Sai and be treated as a scientific wonder with no agency. Yet, we never find out if this will actually happen or not. For all we know, Fuminori is letting his fear dictate his recovery and that his condition might be easily reversible. The operation performed on him is known to have side effects, sure, but it would be exceptionally bizarre if T-University didn't have treatments for them. Correspondingly, however, we do learn from Tombo that T is known to cover up any scandals that would affect how it runs. Either way, Fuminori would have to take a risk, something that his fear prevents him from doing. If I may borrow a quote from the champion of the Space Jam and head of the B-Ball Removal Department, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Fear is a natural emotion that humans experience when it comes to dealing with stressful situations. There's no shame in being afraid or fearful of what might happen in the future. Even the best of people grapple with the leviathan known as fear. It's when you let fear stagnate your soul does it become shameful, and that's what Fuminori lets run rampant in his person. Instead of admitting that he has a problem and seeking help for it, he'd much rather bury his head in the slime. And though I have criticized this action as this behavior is detrimental, this showcases my main point. Some people react to uncertainty by rising to the occasion, others cower, unable to set a course in the sea of worry and wind up dashed across the stones. Both reactions are, in their very nature, humanistic. And before I continue, this isn't me deriding people who struggle with their demons. We all have a few, and for some, our demons are the equivalent of the world Atlas has to hold up. But unlike the Lone Titan, we don't have to suffer alone. Just because someone has been thrown into the rocks doesn't mean they're a failure of a human being. All it means is that they need some help. In saying this, it is up to the person flayed out on the pebbles to acknowledge their own shortcomings and ask for assistance. Saya's fear is much the same as Fuminori's as neither can live without the other, but her downfall is her jealousy. I propose this, what reason does Saya have to help Fuminori with his issues? If she wanted to aid Fuminori, she wouldn't indulge him or his fantasies. She would push him to seek help from those who could also provide it. Yet, the reason why she doesn't do this is because that would mean others would be able to work their way into Fuminori's heart, and her role in his life would be diminished. That is the terror of jealousy, a verdant serpent whose venom slowly corrodes all it touches. In her emerald eyes, Fuminori is only meant for Saya, everyone else be damned. Using this view on how Saya wants her relationship to go with Fuminori, it would make sense that she wouldn't tell him the truth. The most notable scene of this is when Saya examines Fuminori's charts. She makes it a point to tell Fuminori that with what he has, human doctors won't be able to cure him. Is she saying that because that is the harsh reality of Fuminori's brain injury? Or, more insidiously, is she lying to Fuminori knowing that he will believe every word that comes out of her mouth? When someone is deeply, or pun intended, madly in love with someone else, they'll do anything in their power to make sure their opposite only has eyes for them. And, like with fear, this can lead to degenerate behavior and is thoroughly rooted within our own humanity. One of the most horrific fates in the story is doled out all because of jealousy, all because Saya wants Fuminori to love her. What truly makes the duo the personification of our nature is how quickly on a dime they can change. When we first get introduced to Fuminori and Saya, we are mostly on their side. Sure, Fuminori doesn't win himself any favors with his brutal, downright nasty rejection of Yo, and while the severity of it is quite out of bounds, something Fuminori brings up himself, it can at least be seen as understandable. Imagine living amongst horrors so foul, so appalling that they make your skin crawl and not wanting to blow a gasket at one of them. It's human nature to want to do so. Yet, as the story progresses, Fuminori and Saya's actions become equally as foul as the monsters Fuminori perceives. It's capstoned with the rape of Yo by the two. Both have seen the repulsive act in close detail. Hell, one of them was raped, yet the two see no issue of committing the act themselves. There is a pointed reason as to why it happens, to showcase that no one is ever truly above carrying out the same atrocity that someone else has afflicted onto them. In the realm of morality, it is better to turn the other cheek than to get even. Getting even just creates an endless cycle that makes the Ouroboros proud. And yet, by our very design, getting even is the much more fulfilling choice of the two. 
I take Fuminori and Saya's violation of Yo as another rebellious yell at the face of a world that has scorned both. If the world is going to quite literally bend one of them over, it'd be rude of them not to pay it back. There is real world basis in this. Look at how many times people hope convicted rapists get raped in jail just so they know how it feels. It's not accomplishing anything, justice has already been delivered, but for our human nature, justice just isn't enough. I feel as if I have to break away from how dour this is becoming to explain that I'm not a morose guy. I fully believe in optimism and the goodness of the human race, but man, we are capable of some truly fucked up thoughts and actions, all because we'll get a tiny bit of satisfaction that will last for, what, a femtosecond? We would sooner choose to screw over our fellow man for a drop of dopamine than to lift them up. A bucket of crabs, you could say. That's what makes ending 2 darkly poetic. Two people thrown out by mankind end up reshaping it inferably for the better if you take Sai and Tombo's words at face value, all because they embrace the most human of emotions. Love. Saya describes herself as a dandelion, but I'd go one step further and say that love is like the flower. It's capable of spreading across vast distances and changing its surroundings, and while I won't say if that is for better or for worse, as love can bring both ruin or creation, that's how powerful it is. I won't argue that Fuminori and Sai's love isn't toxic, it is, but I will say that it is genuine. Ending 2 is also the most uplifting of the three, a paradoxical statement to write and say, seeing as the end of the world as we know it happens. I think this stems from Ending 2 being an embrace of our better nature and defiance of our worst aspects, as it can be read that us becoming monsters is all our negatives bubbling up to the surface and forming our new body, leaving only our best selves as the personality, as opposed to Ending 3's soul-crushing confirmation that everything we choose to believe in is a lie and the world is a shitty place. This is deeply ironic seen as Koji is the character who's trying to set things right. His curse is determination, it drives him to a bitter end where death is his only solace. The thing is, he could have taken a step back. Koji's first choice of calling the cops ends up being vindicated in Ending 3 where the police find the bodies in the Sakisaka and Suzumi fridges. But because Koji's grudge is so personal, he lets it cloud his judgment and reason to the point that he becomes consumed with mindless hate. A slave to it, as the story puts it. It all goes back to what I said about dopamine earlier, and that's ultimately why Koji doesn't land the killing blow on Fuminori. He would get no joy from it. It's like the facade that Koji had created for Fuminori, an unrepentant monster that had torn Koji and his friends' lives into shreds, had fallen away at the last possible moment to reveal that not only was Fuminori just a person, but a broken one at that. We build up our enemies as threats to us and don't treat them as human because it's easier to kill something that isn't recognized as one. That's why tribalism exists as a concept. It's much harder to strike down someone when you can see that they are just like you. And in that brief moment when Koji saw how placid Fuminori was, he saw that the man that was originally his best friend had lost everything as well. In turn, that's why Koji takes his rage out on a dying Saya. He sees her as the reason why Fuminori became the way that he did, ignorantly clinging onto that idea as if to deny the truth of Fuminori's life. It's easier to believe that a monster made Fuminori a killer as Koji only sees Saya for what she is, but the reality is much stranger than that. Koji and Tombo are on the same level as the cops that the doctor complains about as they are rushing to the most logical conclusion in their eyes just like the police would. It's doubly worse as the two have Ogai's words to go off of since he explicitly states that Saya has developed what could be considered a personality. What makes Koji being unable to kill Fuminori stand out even more is that Fuminori and Saya both predicted that would happen during their battle plan talk. Fuminori states that Koji won't be able to kill him because his friend will struggle to come to grips with murdering another person while he will easily be able to kill Koji because he doesn't see him as such. Both predictions end up being true. Koji is easily snuffed out by Saya because she and Fuminori view Koji as an attacker, an aggressor who is nothing like them. He is but an obstacle to their happiness that must be killed. Koji, meanwhile, wants to kill Fuminori to prove that reason exists in the world, which while it's stated multiple times that's the only reason why Koji continues down his dead end, as justice and revenge don't mean anything to him, I would argue that Koji's reason for fighting is delusional. He's only saying that to himself so he doesn't have to acknowledge the grim reality of the situation he's been put into. If Koji Koji says he's fighting for reason, that means he doesn't have to feel bad for killing Fuminori. In his mind, he's doing the right thing, despite how low he's sunk from himself. He just doesn't notice it until Fuminori breaks. Everything Koji shuddered out of his mind enters it once again, and reality hits him like a ton of bricks. I'm not going to claim that Koji is just as bad as Fuminori, that would be disingenuous and I would have to overlook the planned crimes Fuminori committed. What I will say is that Koji, just like Fuminori, had his personality morphed to the point that he's no longer recognizable as the heart of his friend group, all because he wanted something other than justice. Once again, this is entirely linked back to what we are as a species. 
I don't feel that I'm overtly qualified to talk about how people should handle their emotions as I can only explain myself. I'm not a doctor or a therapist, I'm only a video editor who likes to talk about video games and visual novels that interest him. I can fully understand why people want revenge or vengeance separate from what I've said earlier about justice not being enough, but there is a difference between having those thoughts and letting go of them to find inner peace and acting upon them and jumping on the slippery slope. Koji's decision to go after Fuminori to kill him is the slippery slope. The justice option would have been calling the police, but Tombo talked Koji out of doing that by being half truthful. The police wouldn't have cared for the roaming alien and perhaps that part of the case would go the way of Ogai, but Fuminori, just like he was in Ending 3, would be condemned as a serial killer cannibal. Someone could make a point that Saya could break out a locked up Fuminori, but this isn't like the Ogai situation. No one truly knew Ogai and he didn't commit any crimes known to the public allowing him to ghost. Not only would Fuminori be known as a dangerous man, where could Fuminori and Saya go to? Both need to eat the flesh of other living animals, human or otherwise, an action that would cause a disturbance. For as much as I dislike the hospital interlude, it goes out of its way to say that people notice the many dogs and stray cats that went missing near the hospital. While we know the hospital is shady as all get out, T University isn't the world. All it would take would be one fatal step. Koji is just as tragic as both Fuminori and Sai because while Koji has good intentions, he either stands by as a bystander when he should be doing something to help or he lets his own contempt for Fuminori twist his selfless actions. He had three months to spot that something was wrong with Fuminori and only saw that there was when he finally went off the deep end. He could have called the cops and taken a risk, but Koji let his own hate drive him to deal with Fuminori by himself. And as I have been saying on repeat for this entire section, this is an aspect of our nature. Hope can give into despair, joy into rage, and love into hate, but so too can despair change to hope, rage to joy, and hate to love. Such is the whimsical nature of our soul. This is not to condone any of the actions that I've described, however, just because we have an explainable reason for why we do the things we do doesn't mean that our choices are always right. If I may, seen as I think this is a perfect ending to this section, but I haven't talked about the writing style, I would like to talk about Gin's writing for the story. If ever there was a master of painting a picture in your mind, it would be Gen. The way he delves into describing sequences is phenomenal, and he doesn't suffer from what Nasu sometimes does, which is using awkward metaphors or clunky adjectives that kill the mood of a scene. That's what's masterful when it comes to any scene with Saya or a flesh beast. Gen never directly tells his audience what the creature looks like, because he knows that if he sprinkles in just enough detail, the image in your head will be much scarier than whatever he can come up with. Sometimes we don't need to see the monster in all its full glory to be well and truly terrified of it. That's not even going into his character writing, which is on point as well. Gin writes the characters not only be believable, but painfully humanly so. For a story that is all about the nature of humanity, this helps to elevate the whole tale to another level. <laughs> Presentation is, next to story, the most important aspect when it comes to a visual novel, something Saya nails out of the park all because of its usage of color and sound. From the word go, the color red is forced into the player's face to put the reader in Fuminori's shoes and to associate the color of horror, rot, and disease. Anything red or highlighted by is meant to invoke disgust, like with the streets and buildings coated in a reddish meat moss to the flesh beasts which either have red shading or have red as their flesh color. Likewise, green is meant as a calming color for the reader in Fuminori. Saya herself is accentuated with green and most of the world within Saya, when not under Mito Vision, has a slight greenish tint. The paint that Fuminori uses within his house is also seen as green, and Fuminori's thoughts even say that he was finally able to get a good night's sleep after the bedroom was painted. That also explains why Tombo has green hair. In all reality, she constitutes as one of the heroes in the story since she is the one going out of her way to figure out what happened to Dr. Ogai as well as stop Saya. Her hair being green is to clue us into her true nature in the plot, and the same thing can be said for the brief moments that we see of Saya when not in Fuminori's POV. Her flesh is mostly variations of the color red, and while the most we see of her is after she has died, it's keeping in with the color theme the presentation has. Sound-wise, Saya is a haunting piece of media. The first time that you hear a flesh beast speak, it sticks with you because of how utterly bizarre yet coherent it sounds. As I said in the story section, it's like hearing a radio filtered through swamp water. Bits and pieces of words can be made out, but the language can be indiscernible at times and can come across as white noise. It's oppressive and naturally vile, and just like the color red is meant to off-put the reader and put them into Fuminori's headspace. This is capstoned by the music. Many of the more frightening scenes are backed by either slower tracks to accentuate the dread or by highly erratic musical scores to play up the terror of the scene. The opposite is done in the more placid moments. The crowning jewels for the soundtrack is the eponymous tracks, however, as it perfectly encapsulates the character of Saya. Starting off with harmonious humming and a slow backing track before giving way to heavy sound distortion reveals the true nature of Saya as while her outward appearance 
appearance is that of a petite girl past that exterior lies something otherworldly. The vocal version of the Song of Saya, meanwhile, details Saya's legitimate love for Fuminori and what their love will bring to the world, a place that Fuminori can live in without fear. On the other end is Shoes of Glass, a piece that is of both Fuminori and Koji. It is about how broken the two's lives are, but there is a distinct difference between the two. There are two choruses in Shoes of Glass, one representing each of the characters. For Fuminori, his chorus is about the past, the life he was removed from. He still has someone by his side, Saya, but his past can't be reclaimed while he hangs on to Saya, thus he opts to let it slip away from him. Koji's chorus, meanwhile, is about his future, the normal life he will never have. Unlike Fuminori, Koji is all alone and can only instruct onlookers to witness how broken he has become, and try as he might, he can't gather the pieces of his life back together as they always slip out of his hands. Rounding out the presentation is both the CG artwork and the voice acting. While I don't think the CG characters are groundbreaking, as many of the characters are kinda plain, I think that helps add contrast to the flesh beasts and Saya, who are both fantastical. It also helps express that the story is about regular people who just so happen to be thrust into a situation far beyond the realms of normalcy. I will say this for the characters, each one is at least recognizable. The backgrounds, meanwhile, are a bit boring outside of the one seen in Fuminori view. However, just like with the characters, that kinda is the point. In all reality, all the horrible imagery Fuminori sees is actually quite mundane. There are unique CG scenes for certain events in the story which do stand out and are quite nice to look at, like Indy 1's final CG or Saya's bloom. Guiding us through the work is some top-notch voice acting, with the standouts being Yasunori Matsumoto's Koji and Naoko Takano as Saya. Matsumoto hits it perfectly on the head with his portrayal as Koji, a man that is slowly but ever surely losing his own mind because of what Fuminori has done. The inflection and tone Matsumoto gives to Koji is spot on as he goes from quiet and meek to screeching like a banshee over the course of the story before finally giving way to a defeated and dejected intonation. Out of everyone on the cast, however, Naoko is perfect as Saya. She's able to make the character come across as both charming and endearing as well as deplorable and monstrous, all the while making sure that Saya never loses her innocent tone of voice. <laughs> Well, this is a bit awkward. Saya no Uda is a straight visual novel, meaning there is no gameplay of the sorts besides clicking to advance the story. There are options to auto-advance the story and skip as well as save and load, but those aren't mechanics I can critique. Instead of choosing to waste more of your time than I already do with these videos, going forward, if a VNI cover has gameplay, this section will remain. If not, I'll jump to good instead. <laughs> To me, the best aspect of Saya no Uda is how grey both Fuminori and Saya are. One of the core themes of the story is the complexity of human nature, something that is perfectly displayed by Fuminori and Saya. It takes a skilled writer to create a character who is both extremely sympathetic and unapologetically loathsome, you let alone two characters, but Gin gets it just right with the two main leads. Fuminori early in the story does display some aloofness to his friends, and while his rejection of Yo can fall into the excessive category, it doesn't come from nowhere. Imagine if one day everything he knew about the world had completely changed and that you couldn't open up to the people you considered your friends about it. Imagine the crushing weight of isolation, of loneliness, of alienation. That's what is going through Fuminori's mind. To say that doesn't make him a sympathetic character, then I don't know what does. But therein lies the twofold tragedy of Fuminori Saki Saka. Not only could this have happened to anyone, Fuminori himself is the cause of some of his problems. The car wreck that happened to the Saki Saka family was entirely an accident, but one with lasting consequences. Wrong place, wrong time, the nature of the world and how cruel it can be. Fuminori before the wreck lived a somewhat good life. He had friends, was attending college, and while he didn't want to get romantically involved with Yo, he was kind to her. The accident, much like with any event of that caliber, took away Fuminori's stability. However, instead of trying to get his life back in check, Fuminori continues his downward spiral by withdrawing from the world as a whole, which is an entirely human reaction. For some people, it's better to stay stagnant than to risk trying to make things better. To Fuminori, he'd much rather live how he does now than to tell his friends and Tombo about what he's suffering from, as in his mind, he's afraid of being locked up and treated like a medical guinea pig. The thing is, there is nothing in the story that outright says that will happen to Fuminori if he tells anyone. It is an irrational line of thinking, but it's well placed in the human emotion of fear and anxiety. For all we know, there might be a simple cure to Fuminori's agnosia and he's doubting for nothing. We are told that the procedure that did save Fuminori's life has a list of side effects that are common, so it is safe to assume that someone else who had the operation must have gone through the same problems as Fuminori. Likewise, however, Fuminori's line of thinking does have some merit to it. T University is known for covering up any wrongdoings within the hospital, and Dr. Ogai was not only originally a part of the staff, but also showed off his rad experiments to some of his colleagues at his workplace, so who knows whatever illicit activities the hospital engages in. That's not to say that everyone on the staff condemns these actions, but it is always worry 
worrisome when the place you work for tells you to forget any strange occurrences that have happened during your time there. What is well beyond soul-crushing is that there is no clear answer for Fuminori. I can condemn his more heinous actions as plotting to murder your best friend and raping a woman are both sickening, but I have a harder time doing that for his not as unsavory behavior. Sure, I can call him out on his coldness, but it would be me sitting in an ivory tower unaware of what is really going on. And while I will state that this might be my most divisive opinion I've ever shared, I can even slightly look past the cannibalism. Fuminori has to eat something and all the times he's committed it, it's either because he didn't know, as with Omi, was done out of self-defense, as with Yosuke, or was out of his hands, Yosuke's family. Fuminori's not going around killing people to eat them, he's only eating human flesh out of self-preservation, much like the survivors of Uruguayan Flight 571. His enjoyment of human flesh is a bit worrisome, however, as in his warped senses, Fuminori does say it tastes good to him, that's why I can only slightly look past his eating of man meat. Going back to the state of Fuminori's life, what doesn't help him is that the love of his life is an enabler for his actions. Saya, despite physically being a shogoth, definitely has a human soul, though because she has one, not only is Saya capable of displaying the goodness of humanity, but also the worst of it. Throughout all the scenes we see her in, the number one thing on her mind is Fuminori. Sai wants to do anything in her power to help her lover, which even includes indulging his worst desires. The transformation and subsequent rape of Yo, while not Fuminori's idea as he only said to Sai that he doesn't want to kill Yo, ended up going along with Fuminori's master plan of dealing with his friends. It is said that Sai went full on with her idea as a way to make Fuminori happy, but there is also a tinge of jealousy in the mix due to Yo's body type being much more pleasing to Fuminori. But is ultimately the tragedy of Sai is the fact that she isn't human, and thus her trying to come to terms with being one is incompatible with her very nature. Making matters worse is that her her only role models were Dr. Ogai, a social outsider because of his interest in the occult, and Fuminori, a man who has been completely cut off from the rest of the world. I won't call Saya's love of Fuminori insincere because it definitely isn't, both were lost in their lives before they met. What I will say is that her love of Fuminori is toxic. Instead of wanting to help correct his path once he starts nose-diving into murder, Saya joins Fuminori for the ride. Though in saying this, Fuminori is much more at fault for his actions compared to Saya as he knows what is right and wrong in human society. So while I can and will denounce Saya's wrongdoings, it's not like she knows better. Her own upbringing is at fault, as while Saya is fully capable of determining answers to the most complex math equations in the world, her analytical mind can't figure out the human soul as it isn't something you can solve with logic. In all honesty, it would have been better if Saya immediately initiated her species' plan of mass transformation as at least then you could denounce her as a mindless blob monster. But that's what makes Fuminori and Saya powerful leads. They're complex characters in a complex situation displaying the complexity of human nature. At one moment, Fuminori and Saya are the sympathetic leads, doing whatever they can to live their lives as best as they can while trying to fix the issues that are afflicting them. Then, on a dime, the two can be remorseless villains who not only destroy everything around them, but manufacture even more grief for themselves and the people around them. Those two aren't the only good duo, however, as I love Koji and Tombo's rapport. Tombo, the moment she starts closely working with Koji, starts to see the signs that he will undoubtedly become just like her. She tries to push him out of it, saying that what he's going to do won't be satisfying and will leave him a shell of who he is, but because of Koji's hate reaching its fever pitch, he sees no reason to stop. And the thing is, both of them are at fault for this. Tombo herself has completely lost touch with her humanity, thus her reasoning for Koji quitting while he is ahead makes no sense to someone who still has theirs. She fails to see Koji hunting down Fuminori as a personal matter because she has lost touch with what people are. The only way she can see things is in a clinical state, completely disregarding that humans are driven by much more than simple logic. In a way, her telling Koji to stop is hypocritical, as Tombo herself has gone to such drastic lengths to end her utterly pointless and one-sided vendetta against Ogai. On the flip side, Koji becomes so overtaken by hatred that he doesn't listen to Tombo's words until he finally reaches his breaking point. He doesn't see his own righteous anger as the same kind that Tombo has for Ogai and willfully refuses to believe anything she says by telling himself that he's completely different from Tombo. The irony of that being that they are both the same. Their own determination has melded them into Ahab. And what makes this comparison even funnier is that Tombo is a doctor and Koji is the heart of his circle of friends. Both are meant to be caring people, yet both are motivated by scorn. <laughs> An issue that Saya does suffer from is the pacing. Some scenes can drag out for a bit too long for my liking, such as Tombo and Koji's discussion at the diner. I get that it's the culmination of the two's research into Saya and that they're forming a plan that they will put into motion about two hours later, but like with some of their other conversations, it lapses into Tombo telling Koji to quit while he's ahead and Koji saying that he must save his grudge against Fuminori. I got it the first time Tombo said that to him, I don't need to hear it in every ever scene that the two are in. Likewise, the hospital interlude that explains the urban legend connected to Saya is a complete waste of time. If 
If this was the only time we learned about Saya's stay at the hospital, sure it wouldn't be great, but it at least keeps her nature shrouded in mystery. However, that isn't the case, as both before and after the interlude, Saya and Fuminori expound on their time at the hospital, making the interlude utterly moot. Saya herself tells Fuminori everything she did at the hospital, meaning if the purpose of the interlude was to keep her character in the dark, there goes that, and if it was to provide information about her, Saya does that herself. The only thing I can think of that the scene adds is that it explains that a baby went missing at the hospital and that it was never found. All this does is confirm Saya as the culprit when it comes to Omi's death, which didn't need confirmation seeing as only two people live at the Sakisaka residence, and it's already hinted that one of them isn't human. It feels that this scene should have been placed right after Fuminori's first visit with Tombo in this story to explain why the hospital isn't a welcoming place, at least in Fuminori's eyes. Despite me praising the presentation earlier, it is connected to quite possibly the worst moment in the VN, the fight between Koji and Fuminori. The fight itself is pretty good, as it isn't so much a battle as it is two untrained college students bumbling around to try and get the better of the other. It's the fact that Butt Rock is blaring as the two clash that ruins the immersion. Butt Rock, video game-wise, has a good track record, just look at the Sonic series God Hand or Devil May Cry, but if there's one place to put Butt Rock into, it wasn't this scene. The tone becomes muddled due to the track Savage, which is this strangely triumphant song when the scramble between Fuminori and Koji is anything but that. A slower, more somber track would have fit in perfectly, conveying that it has finally come to this between the two former friends. Speaking of a confusing tone, ending 3 has it in spades. Koji's continual mental anguish is terrifying as he ends up being just like Tombo and Fuminori, a reject of society that chooses not to seek help for his own issues. But what takes all the wind out of ending 3's horror is Koji having a conversation with hallucination Tombo. It comes across as unintentionally funny, which is the worst way it could have come across. If it was going for a more gallows-styled humor, which it slightly does when Koji brings up shooting himself to end the suffering, I wouldn't be as annoyed with ending 3 as gallows humor isn't funny in the normal sense. It's laughing at how cruel the world can be because the alternative is just succumbing to anger and sadness. I don't get that from ending 3 as it accidentally falls into comedy when Koji has a detailed chat with Tombo over his well-being, and when I mean chat, the hallucinated Tombo does speak to Koji like she is actually there. If Tombo wasn't hurt and Koji was just talking to dead air, I think the scene would be better. Saya no Uda's subject matter isn't for everyone, but for those that choose to read it are rewarded with a darkly tragic tale of love and the complexity of human nature. Fuminori and Saya are both deeply faceted characters as they display the best and worst parts of what it means to be human. The duo switch between being sympathetic as their blight affects their livelihoods to being complete monsters, toying and manipulating others for their own gains. What adds to this is that the lives of Fuminori and Saya are complex and there are no real answers to any of their problems, making the story both engaging and horrifying. Saya is thankfully easy to purchase through the Steam storefront, though the uncensored patch must be bought from Jast USA to experience the true song of Saya. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> my